note says we're now streaming live on Facebook. Uh, welcome, Bulldog Nation, to virtual G Day. It, you'll never forget G Day 2020, I guess, will you? Um, <laughs> you know, ordinarily we'd be sitting in on a beautiful day in Athens, we'd be sitting in uh, Sanford Stadium getting ready for uh, a real G Day game, but uh, this is what you got here in 2020 uh, in the time of COVID-19. So uh, it's a virtual game. Uh, you see Chuck and Eric. Uh, I'm not sure what the screen configuration is. Um, and we've got our producers today, uh, Jen Gallus and Mike Bilbo with us, helping us out. We'll be here for the next couple of hours. SEC Network is, is going to be airing the uh, Georgia-Notre Dame game from last year. Uh, so we're going to be watching that while we're talking to you and talking to each other. We've got some special guests lined up today. Uh, I've got a handful of folks that will be joining us a little bit later on, including uh, Coach Kirby Smart's expected to come in with us. Oops, I touched my face. Sorry about that. Um, I got a hand sanitizer right down here. It's a no-no. And I got, my, I got my mask. I got my Bulldog mask. Oh, that looks good. So uh, I'm set to go. We've got, we've got booth snacks. And just so everybody knows that these are the, those are my favorite, the EL Fudge. Those are my favorite, the EL Fudge. And and right <laughs> now the Bulldogs are running onto the field to a packed stadium on what was an electric night, not too long ago, but boy, it seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? It does. And I got to tell you, one of the great parts of any Bulldog game for me, the coin flip, it's sponsored by Georgia's own credit union. I get to go out midfield, you know, get the mic in there with the two captains and the referee uh, who was, uh, we had Flanagan was our referee for this game. And if I recall correctly, uh, I believe Georgia won the toss, deferred to the second half, but nevertheless, we were going to have a game and that's what mattered in that electric atmosphere with all those fans and all those lights in the stands. It was going to be sensational. You want to hear it at this point? You ready for it? We're you ready. just walked off the field, Chuck, so give it to All us. Right. All right, here we go then. You ready? It's the dogs. It's the fighting virus. I mean, fighting Irish. <laughs> Let's get it on. <laughs> oh, Chuck, man. it is the, it you is know, the best part. There wasn't a lot of buildup for this game, was there? <laughs> oh, I, I'll tell you, you, you know what I remember from from this, this game is that, uh, of course, it was an 8 o'clock kickoff, uh, but – the campus was packed for days, obviously, leading into this uh, into this football game. Uh, obviously, the dogs won a couple of years ago. Uh, we had the, I guess it was the launch of the new LED light. So the stadium was, was, was getting lit up. You can see it on TV right now uh, with the flashing red lights. And uh, the, I don't know if I've ever seen an atmosphere as electric as, as that night in Athens and boy, what, what a, what a start to the, obviously wasn't the start of the 2019 season, but really got us on the, on the run. It was just a phenomenal spectacle. Z, Z what you mentioned is really correct. I mean, it was kind of the start to the college football season. It was the game that everybody, and I mean, coast to coast, all college football fans had circled on their calendar as the do not miss game. You know, the thing that Im impressed me the most is I, as I watch these aerial shots of, the, of Sanford Stadium, uh, the fact that the previous two years, you know, when we played up there in 17, their stadium kind of looked like this also. But we didn't, we didn't give it up. I mean, the Notre Dame had, had just a little section of, uh, of uh, blue and green and gold, uh, and it was, it was dominant. It was dominant Georgia red and black and uh, that was great to see as, as the people in this state and in, the, in this area had really anticipated this game. And uh, boy, it paid dividends, didn't it? Boy, it, it really, no it really did. Yeah. And, you know, the, the Bulldog Nation, it really, when you look at, at Kirby Smart and when he arrived in Athens, uh, the magical run we went on when we played up in South Bend and, and how the Dog Nation traveled there and then uh, obviously, later on in that year, on, after the great run that we went on, uh, we invaded uh, Pasadena. The uh, played in that football, you know, played in the Rose Bowl, an epic game, and uh, played in the national championship game. The, the Bulldog Nation over the past, uh, and really, you can almost trace that back to to a G Day game 
where within that G Day game, we called uh, to, for 93,000 strong to show up. They absolutely showed up, and uh, we've been showing up everywhere across the country since. Yeah, I think that game, though, that you're talking about at South Bend, I think that made a statement uh, to the college football nation uh, that Georgia fans travel, and when they come, look out if they're coming to your town. Well, this game that we're watching today, uh, largest crowd to ever see a football game in the state of Georgia because, you know, as we, we added the 500 seats That's in right. the West End Zone, and it uh, put it over 93,000 uh, as an official attendance. Um so unless the stadium expands again, I mean, that, that record's going to stand for a while, I would imagine. Yeah, and a hot rod started it off with a uh, kick it with a touchback uh, for the dogs, and uh, that was five that they had on the night. Uh, I mean, he's it was just what a weapon, that guy. We're going to miss him. I see Tom Hart on the screen here. Where'd you go, Tom? SEC Network, Tom Hart's going to join us here uh, in a few minutes, one of our, uh, one of our guests for the next couple of hours and he walked away from his screen have we okay. been doing that much lately have you been walking away from your screen <laughs> no. at, at home i try to do that as much as possible i've got like five around me right now yeah no, it's a, it's a new world we're living in i've been locked into these zoom meetings and and facebook non-stop it feels like there's tom hey tom He's not just sure if laughing tom can hear us yet Tell him to hit the mute, to hit the mute button on his screen. <laughs> I'm sure he knows what he's doing. He may just. I be doubt it. I know Tom. I doubt it. <laughs> you know, guys, this this game really turned out to be a defensive defensive struggle, and as you know, we'll go through the the the, the first quarter and and no points on the board, and uh, it, just amazing the level at which our defense played last year. Uh, Really, with no superstars yeah, I, I, I emerging, mean, muted, but I could, to be I could still hear it. Defensive struggle, and as you know, we'll go through the the, the, the first quarter, and, and no points on the board, and uh, it, just amazing the level at, at which our defense played last year. Uh, really, with no superstars yeah, I, I, emerging, I mean, I muted, but I could, to be I could still hear it. Defensive struggle, yeah. and we'll go through the the, the the first quarter, and, and no points on the. board. Now I see uh, Eric Stokes, who was injured in this ball game. Uh, we lost a couple of guys in this game. Uh, Kenley got hurt, uh, didn't come back. Did Stokes come back? Uh, he, he came back. Uh, he was unable. He stood on the sideline for the most part. I do recall him going to the locker room. Uh, and then that was an injury that bothered him some for the remainder of the season, if you'll recall, until very late in the year. What was interesting to me, was that uh, it was clear that Notre Dame uh, had scouted Georgia really well and prepared a good game plan in that they came out, they weren't even trying. I think they only rushed it like 14 times for the entire game. They knew that trying to run against that Georgia defense, that was basically a non-starter. So instead, they threw it 47 times. Hey, guys, and, Tom, and Tom's audio is working now, so you guys can talk to him now. Hey, Tom, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. Well, good. The second, third time's a charm. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah you yeah, sound great, great, Tom. Um, I went back. I, I, I have such a big football itch. I've been watching this game the last couple of days. I, I think you guys would agree. Going back to this game, where you could pick any game, just gives me such a feel for football and appetite for it in this atmosphere the electricity in the stadium. I mean, this is this is unbelievable. What a great game to pick. This is this is going to be a fun watch today. I was doing There's the no same thing that you were thing. doing. I, I was watching the game midweek, and and my family was was with me, and and we were all just kind of sad because we don't have that right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it brought back some great memories. I think it points out, Tom, and I think you'd agree. That what an important part to the psyche of the nation that sports matters. I mean, it really does matter. 100%. Um, you know, we are being very good about staying at home. My family and I, um, we get out and go for walks through the neighborhood. I've got the Coxes live right across the street. They're watching right now. And every time I see them, it's it's the same conversation. When, do, when are sports going to be back? When do we get to watch our dogs? When are the Braves going to be back? When, when is yeah. everything going to get back to normal? 
Um, and it's a conversation I have, whether it's uh, at the grocery store or walking the dog, whatever it might be, it's a sign of normalcy. But just this shot right here, I don't know where you guys are. We're coming back from break. But what I was so impressed with, this is a rare chance I had last season where I had a noon game at LSU Vandy that day. And so I hightailed it back from Nashville. I got on my couch, poured a drink, and turned this game on. And CBS did such an amazing job capturing the electricity in the stadium. Of course, you guys were there, so you knew it. But from sitting at home and having a national opponent like Notre Dame, a top 10 opponent in the building, I thought did a remarkable job of continuing to push the Georgia brand from a national perspective. For people who have never been in Sanford Stadium and will never be, playing an opponent like Notre Dame in your stadium with this atmosphere exposed a whole lot more people to the brand. I think you just saw uh, a false start on Notre Dame's part. That crowd played such a, played such a huge role. As Coach Smart's always uh, pointing out that the, the fans matter when they're loud. It disrupts the opposing offense. That's a and great job. We 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 we're going to have for four hours that day, and Notre Dame had 12 penalties. Uh, most of them were of that variety of false starts and just, uh, you know, kind of mental mistakes more than anything else. And, and as you pointed out, Chuck, a large uh, reason for that was, uh, was the terrific crowd that we had. Yeah, and they were electric all day long. I mean, it was uh, the, the, the buildup to this football game for the Bulldog Nation uh, it, it was as it, it felt like you were playing in a in the Rose Bowl or in a national championship kind of game, uh, and then you add uh, in, into the game the end game experience right now in Athens over the past three or four years. Uh, it really has been a sight to see. Uh, the, you add the LED lights into it. This was the first time that, that the stadium was going to glow in red, and uh, it, it just adds such a unique element. The new sound systems that that we've got. Um, it is a special, special place to be, and Notre Dame felt it for sure. Hey, Z, while we're, while we're on the subject, I'm watching uh, Komet really tear us up here in the beginning of this ball game. What were they doing to be so effective with that big tight end? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I think Chuck said it pretty well coming into this football game. They, they scattled us very well. They knew that they were going to have uh, a hard time running the football, and 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 we have historically here over the past couple of years like to play a lot of cover two looks. And uh, so two high safeties. And when you do that, you provide some opportunities for big tight ends to, to, to really do some damage in the middle of the field and the soft spots of that, of that two deep zone. Uh, and, and we were content to keep that football in front of us. You know, we, we know our strengths. We knew our football team uh, at this time, or at least the coaches did that, uh, we're going to rely on on a running game. We're going to rely on on a defense playing very sound and, and not giving up cheap touchdowns. It's exactly what we did. And and because of that, Komet had a, had a big football game. And we got hurt with tight ends really throughout the year. And when you say hurt, uh, it was really the one option opposing offenses could go to because of the style of defense we were playing. So they hurt from the standpoint of yardage, not necessarily touchdowns, but you're right. They were – teams were able to move up and down the field using their tight end against us better than any other option, really. That's right. And again, it was, it was by design. We're not going to give up. Uh, we're not going to give up points. You're going to have to be methodical uh, and, and be patient playing offense against us. Uh, and if it's the one thing that we're going to give up, that's what we're going to go do. And uh, one thing Kirby has always done a good job of is taking away superstars and the things that can really hurt you from opposing offenses uh, and again, did it here that Notre Dame's got a great tight end, but we knew going in that if, if he's the one guy that's going to get a lot of catches and stats may look pretty good, he, he's not a guy that's going to go uh, run the football game away from you where you've got to start playing catch up. Is, is Tom Hart still with us? us? Is Tom still with us? Yeah, Tom I'm still is still there. there. Tom, I, I just have one question, buddy. Anybody that knows Tom Hart knows he's one of the better dressed men in all of broadcasting. And <laughs> the last time I saw Tom, we were at a, at a basketball game, Scott. You and I were doing a Georgia basketball game. Tom showed up in sweats because his luggage didn't make it. And I was just curious if he ever got his luggage back. I got my luggage back, Chuck. But if, if that's a new normal for us going forward, I can get used to it. I don't need to wear a tie every night. I'm much more comfortable <laughs> wearing a T-shirt. Well, it's like today, you know? Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Georgia gear today. Speaking of Georgia gear, Kevin Butler has joined us. Hey, Kev. 
Hey, Scott, how are you doing? Hello, Eric. Hello. Kevin, that beard looks good on you, my friend. Well, you know, that's this is about the most fun I'm having at my is to be able to grow my own <laughs> face hair. Let me see. Well, I, everybody else. You're we'll looking see. good. How, how's the family, Kevin? Everybody safe? Yeah, thanks, Eric. I hope everybody's family's safe out there. We are. We're, um, you know, we're dealing with it just like everybody else, just really taking care of my mom and dad. And uh, we have yet to see our new grandchild, uh, Kara, uh, Drew's second daughter in person. But we, you know, thank goodness for the Zoom and the Facebook world. Um, it's been a blessing, no doubt. Well, pass our congratulations on as well for that that new baby. That's just outstanding and wonderful news. And we'll be through this soon where you can give all the hugs and kisses you want to give. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to it. It's um, it's definitely changed our lives. I think it slowed down a lot of things, and hopefully we can speed it back up in time for a, a good college football kickoff. Kevin, yeah, no. why don't you give us some of your uh, memories of that game last year? While well, they're in a commercial break now on the on the SEC Network, but you know what do you what do you recall as you were uh, approaching that day last year? Well, you know what? What really stands out, Scott, it was um, really right before kickoff. I, I was down in the end zone and the team had come out through the end zone. The crowd was going crazy. You know, you saw the lights being worked and I find myself standing next to Greg McGarity. And um, I, I looked over at Greg right when it was just after the national anthem and you know, it, little stream coming down. He, he, he was very emotional and I I looked at him, I got emotional myself. I gave him a big hug and just said, this is unbelievable. He goes, I, he, he looked and with an honesty in his face, he goes, I can't believe we pulled it off. And it was a moment I think in Georgia history and football that certainly an AD um, has a lot invested to it, but to see the way the crowd uh, enjoyed it, to see the way Notre Dame embraced it and all their fans, you know, I think it was a great moment for Greg and for the University of Georgia to make a statement about where college football was that night um, in the United States. That was the epicenter of college football that night, and Georgia uh, certainly turned it out. And that's really what stood out. Very proud moment as an alumni, um, as a, a co-worker with you guys to, to bring that kind of experience to people. Um, it was truly an uh, unbelievable night. KB, I got to tell you that along those same lines and uh, standing next to Greg down in the end zone just before the start, he, he was looking up in that upper deck and all those lights that people had on their phones were already out and shining and it was dark and he looked around at me and he says, be honest, he says, is there any place on this planet you'd rather be right now than right here? <laughs> I said, no, I got to admit it, this, this pretty much tops it. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in that kind of uh, production, a lot of people have a lot of different feelings. You know, Greg was just, I think, overwhelmed by the whole of the reality of it. And then you, you, you look around at somebody like Josh Brooks, and he's staring up at those lights going, oh, I hope they come back on. You know, he, <laughs> he had a whole different view of what was going on. So uh, a lot had to go into that night to pull it off, and uh, a lot of people did a great job. Hey Tom, how does how does this game? And I know you said you watched it on television after you worked that day. But how does how does the atmosphere of this game today compare with some of the other games that, that you work on a regular basis? You get some big SEC games. You know how do, how do they match up? I think what makes this one stand out is we're watching people's uh, pictures might be in different spots, but the way CBS captured the entire atmosphere. They use I'm going to go TV nerd on a sec for a second with you guys. They used a drone for a lot of these live shots out of the stadium. And I've never seen Sanford Stadium look like this. I'm not talking about what you guys <laughs> I mean, from the exterior and pay attention to the second half. There's a shot where a camera comes up outside of the stadium and peers over the top, even below the lights. And it was just, it looked like a cathedral. It was awesome. So you can look at it from a, a, a lot of different perspectives as a, as a fan, um, as somebody invested in the SEC, it was impressive. Um, but you can imagine recruiting to this. I mean, what is – here's a shot right here from outside the club. Yeah, look Let's, at that. That is amazing. You've never seen that shot in college football before. Most, no. most productions don't use drones. And, of course, a blimp is going to be way too high or a helicopter too high for that shot. So you've seen the stadium in a way that I have never seen it before. I don't think anybody has – 
And when I talk to folks that are college football fans nationally, they want to know about well, what's the SEC really like? And all you got to do is turn on this game for them. It, it's, it's amazing. And but not to go on too long, but going back a little bit to having an opponent like Notre Dame, of course, we get these atmospheres uh, when it's a top 10 SEC matchup. But I just think the allure of Notre Dame, that national profile, the, the lights off the golden helmets, that adds a little bit more uh, from a casual fan perspective. Folks tuning in going, wow, I've never seen an atmosphere like this before. Uh, no doubt, Tom. That's that's a, that's well put, and you're right. That, that those drone shots, wow. I mean, you, you know, it does say it, it, the SEC. It just means more. Yeah. <laughs> How do you guys anticipate? You know, once we get back to hopefully the way things used to be at, at some point, but you know, the big the big name teams that are coming into Sanford Stadium over the next decade. You know, Oklahoma, Texas, and. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen Clemson here before, but how, how do you see those type games uh, setting up in, in, in comparing to how this one's set up? That's a great question. I mean, yeah, would I it think, be that much you know, anticipation for an Oklahoma and a Texas coming in, yeah. in years It may ago? take a while, Scott. I mean, it, it may take a while. I mean, I think we'll get back to, to fans in the stands. I'm just not sure that how soon before we'll get back to, to 94,000 or uh, in the stands. I, I'm not sure when that's going to be. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, as far as Georgia fans go, Scott, I think that when those teams come to Athens and there is any sign of a green light, um, we will have 93,000 people there. Um, the fans will come back in droves, but I think, you know, the reality of it is Georgia needs to stay competitive they need to stay in the picture for a national championship, that playoff picture. And that's what really, I think, creates the excitement. I mean, you know, people are believing it. People are wanting it now more than probably we've ever wanted a championship. Oh. And we've got everything setting up that way, certainly with what Kirby and his staff and the administration have done. Um, it, it'll all come back around, just as you say, uh, when it's safe enough to have that atmosphere again. Um, I think Georgia will, will will lead the way. Yeah, Kevin, I, I just to piggyback on that, you know, obviously the key here is um, we, we have to have a green light and people have to feel safe. And uh, we will get to that to that point. You know, I don't know when that point's going to be. I do think it's going to take uh, time. I mean, obviously, if we get released back out without any kind of a vaccine or therapeutics that, that you know, we, we know to be effective. It's going to be slower to get back in. Uh, I don't think you're going to go see 90,000 packed into a stadium uh, this year, but we will get to that point. And, and Kevin, what you said, I think when we do, um, I think the there's so much demand for it and there will be so much ju just pent up emotion for finally being able to get back and get to life as normal. And, and this is life, right? The, the, what makes the SEC different? different what makes the University of Georgia or football in the south is this is part of our DNA it's part of who we are we love it it is part of our life so when we do have that green light and that it doesn't even have to be a big name team coming in when we have that green light and we're able as one big UGA family uh, to get back on that beautiful campus and get back into that beautiful stadium and uh, see those those red flashing lights I think we'll be there in droves. Uh, and I think that excitement will last a long time because it, you, you see and you feel everything that you can take for granted. And we probably all take it for granted to some extent. Uh, well, we shouldn't. And, and this is a, it's a part of who we are. So I think once, once that green light's given and everybody knows that they're gonna be safe, uh, I, I think our stadium will be packed. And I think other stadiums across the, the, the country will be packed because it's, it's such an important part of life. For all of us. Hey, Scott, I'll leave you with this thought to answer that question. Uh, and then I'm going to bounce and let you guys talk more about the game. But um, what I think that we'll see and what we're going to learn this fall, that we all know, but it will become even more, more aware of is the value to a home game, to the city of Athens, to the county, to the area from a financial impact, from it, starting with financials, but, but it, just reaches out with so many different tentacles and in so many different areas of a community. 
And what I'd like to see, and I'm biased here, but there are a lot of big games that are played at neutral sites, especially early in the season. This is a rarity, a top 10 non-conference opponent coming in to Athens, coming into an SEC building. Um, let's try to keep as many of these games as we can. And I know big paychecks come with those others. I, I know what's on the other side of that coin. Let's try to keep as many big games as we can in our communities. Let's take care of those people in our community. Um, the hospitality industry, everything, everything goes hand in hand. And, and this is a great example, um, a picture perfect postcard type night for the Chamber of Commerce and all the businesses that were able to pay their employees on a night like this in Athens. Let's do that instead of farming these games out to big cities and NFL stadiums. Tom, before you go, I got, I got to tell you too, uh, Scott and I were at a meeting with Greg Sankey over in Birmingham. Uh, I guess it was last summer or summer before last. And, and he specifically uh, singled out Greg McGarity and Kirby Smart as guys that were doing scheduling properly. They were bringing in the names like Notre Dame and the Oklahomas and the Texas and Ohio, that they were putting those Clemson, putting those names on that future Georgia schedule for the very purpose that you're just now uh, mentioning, the fact that it, it does stand as a, a postcard for, for all of college football. It's a great scene. It's a remarkable scene. I think um, the, this, may, this game right here, you mentioned it earlier, Scott, the epicenter of college football on this date was such a huge game, not just for Georgia, but for the SEC um, and also, and also for recruiting. I mean, how, what an easy sell this is to everybody that you're convincing to come yeah. to town and uh, put on this uniform. Thanks for having me today, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for joining, Tom. Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Well, yeah, we, still, we still got a scoreless game here, Z. Yeah, and it's a, it was a defensive battle, and I think. Uh, Notre Dame has, has got the football right now, and, and you know how we play defense, but this was really the first time uh, that that we saw that against the Georgia offense, the defensive blueprint that we saw the entire, really the entire year and, and never had answers for. We, you know, we, we had a young receiving core, uh, especially when Lawrence Cager got hurt, um, and, and our, our young receiving core got better through the through the year for sure, had to battle some injuries, but it wasn't really until late in the year that that maybe we started to find our stride, maybe even until the Sugar Bowl that we that we really found our stride. But what Notre Dame did is that they came in and they loaded the box on us. They got up and they pressed, jammed our receivers, made it very difficult for us to get off the football, and uh, it, and we struggled with it. And and we struggled with that really throughout uh, throughout the course of the year. It was a catalyst of of so many of the changes that you saw here in the off season that I know we were all looking forward to with a, a new transfer quarterback coming in, a new offensive coordinator uh, that, that, you know, with, with that, that entire plan of, of getting more into that run option type look, the RPO type look um, that, that is so prevalent now through college football. Uh, it, it, this was really the start of, of so many of the, uh, you know, you're going to call it struggles. We, we still had a phenomenal, phenomenal year, but offensively, you know, it didn't move the football the way we've been able to historically. Um, but this was the, this was the defensive look that we struggled with and give Notre Dame an awful lot of credit. They came in ready to play. They matched the intensity of us and had a good game plan that everybody copied throughout the rest of the year. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, that's what you're seeing right there, Eric, you know, they, they committed to it from the get-go. Notre Dame said, we're going to get those eight in the box. We're going to press you on the outside. We're going to make you beat us the way that we know you can beat us. And that's really what played out. You know, it was the depth of Georgia's team that I really felt changed this game in the second half. Uh, Notre Dame was toe-to-toe -to -toe with Georgia, very physical, uh, very disciplined team. Uh, they did all the right things on offense to keep Georgia on their toes. Uh, but as the game went along, I think it was just the depth of Georgia, that offensive line, being able to get more fresh guys in there. And we just kind of wore them down a little bit at the end. And I think that was their belief, too, after the game. But I think you could see a little bit more physicality from the Georgia team as we get later in the second half. Look at the front line. Look at the defensive line. Um, they just get a little bit ahead of Notre Dame. And that was going to be the difference from the start of this game. Yeah, Kevin, it's and, and you're you're spot on. It's 
the the amount of talent that Kirby and his staff that that they, that we've been able to go recruit to where you can just load up two or three deep where you've got four and five star guys coming in that that honestly could start and really play at, at almost every school in the in the country. But we've got some of those guys coming in as as third string guys um, that and and boy when you talk about being physical, you could sitting in the in the radio booth. You could hear shots even above the, the crowd noise, and it was as electric as, as I've ever seen it inside of, of Sanford Stadium. Uh, you could hear how physical both football teams were, but, but really when, when Georgia gets to you, we get there with an attitude. Um, and we're able to go do that because we've got that – you could just roll guys in throughout the course of the game, and it does it. It'll wear people down, and it, it wore Notre Dame down. And, and I think the one other thing – the crowd noise uh, and the the struggles and the penalties that Notre Dame had. Scott mentioned it, I think, before you got on. What, Scott, 12 penalties in this football game? Yeah. Uh, so many of those, just the five-yard variety that it just stops and, and pauses, drives just enough that it, it makes it very difficult to go put points on the board. There's one uh, right there. <laughs> there was exactly one right. right. Exactly. Yeah, the tight end just took off. Well, you there, know what? There was, there was a lot of that. You got to be thankful for that crowd. Um, a lot of those penalties were caused by the crowd that night. And, and I think that's something that, um, you know, you put those little pipe type plays together. The, the one safety that stood out for me, and I, I can't remember his name right now for Notre Dame, um, just a big force back there, really big player, physical. And, and I thought that was kind of what they came in to do. We're going to play our, outside receivers tight and we're going to use that safety as kind of that fifth linebacker he certainly was physical enough to do that he made his presence felt and that that really kind of broke down another aspect that Georgia thought they were going to use but we never really saw that tight end getting up and trying to protect the middle part of the field well you, yeah, you saw right. Notre Dame have to, and coach Kelly was not real thrilled about it, having to use a timeout the very purpose of that crowd they yeah. couldn't get play off couldn't, couldn't. No, just just tremendous impact. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, the way, the way defense has played is, Kevin, going back to your point around it, a little bit more difficult to get the tight ends into the, into the football game. Uh, you know, when you get that single safety look and, and you've got that, that additional man down in the box that's, that's really clogging up the middle where you've got man to man, where you want to go with the football is on the edge. You've got the matchups that you want. Uh, and we took shots. It's not like we weren't trying to take shots uh, down the football field and take what the defenses were giving us uh, at this point in the season and really throughout the season. Uh, we just weren't there with a young receiving core to get there. Now, uh, you saw in the Sugar Bowl, all of a sudden you do that with a George Pickens that's had a full year underneath his belt and is, is starting to get it. And Don Blaylock, before he got hurt, um, you start to play – if you play us like this in the future with those kind of weapons on the outside, uh, and it sounds like we've got more coming in, um, now all of a sudden you've got your hands full because if, if you've got that superior talent on the outside and it's an opposing defense, you're going to go man up and, and try to stop me from running the football and you're going to put your corners on an island, well, you better have a stud out there because uh, George Pickens and the way he progressed and Don Blaylock, they're going to make you pay – at this point in the season, we just weren't able to do it, which is why we struggled. You know, Pickens didn't have a catch in this game. Cager was outstanding. He had five and made some tremendous catches, but Pickens couldn't couldn't get his hands on one. Yeah, no. you know, the one thing that the one thing that uh, Eric and, and Scott you were talking about is, I think what we saw in this game, we really saw throughout the year that kind of was the disappointment in the offensive line as we. I thought we were very good pass protection. I mean, we had a lot of time some times back there, Eric, and you, you would know any better than anybody, but you, you get a lot of time back there. Sometimes it's almost like something's wrong. And what was wrong is our guys weren't getting open. That's you know, right. The offensive line was doing a great job of protection, but we still lacked that, that explosive push off the line. Separation. To the running game. And that was the one thing I was really looking forward to in this spring game was how coach Luke and that offensive line have responded with a lot of new people in there. And if we can get that explosion off the line and pushing people downfield, like we had two years ago. 
Hey, gentlemen, yeah. I have to tell you, uh, still waiting for Kirby to join us a little bit later on, but Coach Crean, Tom Crean just tweeted out, my one-man tailgate is complete. He thanks Catch-22, the restaurant in Athens, for bringing the food truck, the taco truck, through the neighborhood. So he's, got, <laughs> he's got his food. He says, ready for some Georgia football. Let's go. It's like the old ice cream trucks that used to come through town. Exactly. Come through the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I'd be about that. So you didn't have to, uh, you know, order out as as much as – that's what we've been doing a lot. We we cook periodically, but uh, most of the time you want to get something to eat, you know, you're picking up the phone and, and going to get pickup. Yeah, my wife has me juicing every morning. We are we are juicing spinach, kale, orange apples, carrots, lemons, and then I'm drinking it. <laughs> oh, jeez! I think it's is my it, fault. Is it, uh, is it staying with you long? Hey, Scott, that, that, that's why this looks so good right now, Kevin. Yeah, yeah I've, Scott, I've learned I don't know about you, but I think there went my appetite. <laughs> Oh, one of the big plays of the game just happened as uh, we, we muffed that punt down inside our 10 yard line. And that was uh, that was not a, a great moment in the stadium. And certainly, you know, <laughs> you kind of felt the wind go out of it a little bit. But uh, Tyler Simmons unable to make that catch right around the 11 or so. And Notre Dame cover, uh, recovered that pump in inside the 10. Took them forever to get it in the end zone, though. They finally did. But uh, Georgia's defense had a had a pretty good stand there, just couldn't keep them out altogether. And, and it's one of the things that we've done done so well over the past couple of years, obviously on this this great run that, that we've been on, uh, it's the elimination of, of mistakes just like this. And fortunately here, we're, we're able to overcome it. We get a couple of turnovers here later in the football game that, uh, that, that obviously help us. But uh, so much of, of what Kirby's been able to do is just instill a discipline into this football team where, where the, these mental mistakes or these big mistakes that can shift momentum, um, uh, we, we've minimized those for the, for the most part. Obviously, we haven't been uh, perfect on it. This was, was one here, but um, boy, small little things like that are, are, are such a big deal. And uh, George, again, because of the depth, because of the crowd, able to hang in there even after uh, such a play that did. It sucked the win and sucked the enthusiasm uh, out of this uh, this stadium that had been up to this point electric. Well, they just showed a graphic on the screen said that to this point, Georgia had allowed no red zone touchdowns this season or last season. So this was the first time a team had scored against Georgia. And this was game four uh, when they were in the red zone and they started at the nine yard line or whatever it was. And mm -hmm. it took them forever to punch it in. But uh, uh, that was the first red zone touchdown allowed by Georgia last season. And Komet, it was kind of an accidental catch, wasn't it? You remember the tight end? They'll show it here in a second. But, uh, I mean, they had a back in the back of the end zone. I think he was going to make the catch. Uh, but Komet was underneath him and just kind of reached up with one hand and knocked it to himself accidentally, I think. I don't think he was the intended target. No, I recall the same thing, Scott. It looked like they were going right back to the running back in the back. And um, I guess that's how you get to be a hired – draft pick you just try to get anything comes around you so um, he, he was a force and uh, you know you, you got to stay on him but they certainly uh they fought hard to get in there that was that was a big score for them and that was certainly um important for them at this stage of the game as you can see uh, to take advantage of a turnover by georgia and that was gonna it was gonna be a long time between touchdowns for them that was um that was their only one for a while until what late in the game right Yep. Four, you know, four. we're we're watching this, gentlemen, and I'm I'm thinking to myself: when we do get back to football, most of the analysts around the country are saying Georgia's defense this year will be even better. I agree. And, I, I, I would agree with that too. Yeah, it's you know, look at the people that we've got coming back, and you know, for me, the big difference last year was was we finally were able to develop depth of talent in the trenches. We've always been really good at, at uh, in the secondary. We've always been great at linebacker. Where we've really struggled is, is in the trenches. And, and we've had some first line guys that could go play and go play against anybody. But as you got 
uh, deeper into that, that defensive line, just didn't have the depth of talent. This year, that changed where we could rotate uh, three different sets of defensive linemen in to stay fresh and to, and to be aggressive. And there was very little drop off between the first line guys and, and those guys that were coming in, you know, on the, on the, the, the second and third wave but it was so hard to run the football and that adage, if you can shut down a team when they want to run the football, when they need critical yards uh, to get it on the ground, when you can stop that, you make it very, very difficult for opposing offenses that elevated the Georgia defense this year. Uh, I think as you look into, into to this upcoming season in, in future years, we just have so much athleticism and talent. Uh, I agree. I think that we are just at the tip of the iceberg around how good this Kirby Smart defense can be. You know, and, and guys, you know, while we're still in this commercial break, you know, we're talking about getting back to it and how good Georgia's defense might be. But how much hope did it give you when you heard that the PGA announced that they were going to resume play in June? I mean, that at least makes me think, hey, maybe we are on the verge. Well, they opened the I'm, beaches in Jacksonville. Did you see what happened with that? Yeah. Everybody People went, whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope that that's the case when we open it up for football. I'm yeah. sure it will be, as we were, we were talking earlier. It, as soon as, yeah, as soon as that green light is given and the all clear is sounded, then uh, folks aren't, aren't going to be shying away from, from Georgia football, I don't think. Uh, uh, there's, there's too much invested with it. There's too much love for it. There's... Uh, there's too much anticipation right now. I mean, we're in we're in the kind the the common stopping point. You know, the only thing we're missing right now was was the spring. So there's there's a little bit of agitation about that. But uh, you know, we're going into a, a quiet period anyway. So maybe maybe the timing of this is good as uh, as good as it can be. That that uh, uh, we're not missing live stuff right now. We're not missing right. the season stuff at least at this point. And 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 hopefully we won't miss uh, miss any. If we if we have to miss a little bit or it gets pushed back a little bit, then uh, then certainly that's understandable. But uh, hopefully that won't be the case. Yeah, when you understand the 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 financial impact that college football has, and you see a school like Cincinnati say the other day that they're dropping men's soccer uh, because they they're not going to have the money. I mean that's you know that's scary. Yeah, yeah it, really it is. is. I think that's, um, you know, as Tom was talking about earlier, the, the economic impact that um, football and all the sports and school has on these towns is, is immeasurable. And uh, to be able to get the economy back uh, will certainly support the opportunity for us to have big events. We can't have big events without a lot of people getting their jobs back, without a lot of people working. Um, and, and that's really the first step. And that's what I like to see, you know, with our president and, and, and Pence. I, I was listening to my son's, uh, Drew has a, a podcast that he does, and he had a, a UGA graduate um, talking to him the other day who has been in the meetings with uh, Vice President Pence and the commissioners. And um, it, it's a big task. It, it's not just let's turn on the lights and let's go play. Yeah. There's a lot more that goes on. And, and Chuck, you're, you're right. This is a, a a huge decision that has to start from the ground up. Um, you know, when you talk about the football teams, you know, Georgia plays a lot of young kids. Um, this is hurting us right now, not having these young kids in school in the spring, having class time, having field time, having time with the coaches. Um, as I've always said, confidence comes from not having to think. Um, <laughs> And the more you're in school, the more you're with these coaches, it becomes instilled in you, and you don't have to think. You react. Georgia's defense last year reacted throughout the year great. Um, and even with our young kids in there, uh, that comes from a lot of time spent with them. And, and right now, I know Coach Kirby and, and his staff are doing everything they can, and they're allowed to do, uh, but nothing substitutes for a coach looking you in the eye on the field and asking you if you know what you're supposed to be doing. Um, that's where the road meets the rubber. And, and that, that's that, that's like a guy Notre Dame just scored that, that first touchdown on that commit catch. And you can see uh, Jones, they're back in the back of the end zone. Uh, Z, who was, who was supposed, who's responsible for that guy? 
Yeah, that the, we got we got a little bit con- confused there, and the the replays coming up right now. So we were playing man to man. So cover one, and there was you, you saw Notre Dame's quarterback kind of roll out of the pocket. That that drew us up, but uh, it was probably uh, just from the looks at it, Monty Rice. But we had a blown coverage uh, on on that play. Had a couple of guys that were actually open. You, you go back to the play before that. Um, as you're, as you're watching this game and, and J.R. Reed comes off the edge uh, and, and almost makes a miraculous yeah. interception, gets his hand on the football and, and knocks it down. But uh, you're right. It took so long for that to get in. You, you knew right then, you knew coming into this football game, Georgia's defense was, was rock solid. Uh, but all of a sudden you get a team like Notre Dame, a top 10 team. They've got great players and great talent. Uh, they've got the ball at the, eight or nine yard line and they struggle mightily to get it into the end zone. You knew defensively we were as stout as anybody in the country right then. Reed really had a nice game. He's, he's a guy that uh, he's a guy, pardon the, uh, the cliche. (laughs) Everybody says that he's a guy. Jr. uh, is, is, is going to be missed next year on our defense. I I think as much as, as anybody. Yeah, there's, there's just a leader. Great yeah, leader. go ahead, Kevin. No, just a great leader. I mean, you, you you hope that somebody comes in and fills that spot, but, you know, you could see him not only in this game, but uh, throughout the season, he was a vocal leader. Um, and sometimes, you know, most head coaches will tell you those are the most valuable guys. And, and you're right, Scott. We'll probably see him on TV later on this week in the NFL draft, but uh, uh, we won't see him on the field next year for us. How much, do how much do you guys, and they're in a commercial break on, on the, on the broadcast, but how much, how much does that affect uh, our defense uh, for next season? Who, you know, what, what's the secondary going to look like? Any thoughts on that? Looked pretty good in the uh, Sugar Bowl. Baylor probably give you a better, Baylor probably give you a better answer. <laughs> LeCount came in, you know, he was the voice of that recruiting class that year. And I think, you know, certainly he's in position to be a leader. I think, you know, we've got a tremendous linebackers, even though they're young, it doesn't matter what year you are. And I think Eric will voice this. It's just about who you are, how you carry yourself, how you prepare and how you play. That's how you become a leader. And in college, you have to become a leader uh, by setting the example. We got a lot of guys like that. So, I mean, uh, Aziz, I mean, I think he's one of the best, if not one of the best players in college football for next year as a defensive player. And he finished strong. I'd love to see him as a, as a leader. I think he sets a great example. But listen, I, I completely agree with that. I, I think that yeah, you mentioned his name. That's, that's exactly what I was going to going to mention is uh, Richard LeCount coming in uh, when he was getting recruited. He established himself at that point really as as the leader of this class and of this group. And he's continued to grow and continue to work hard. Had a great season last year. I I think he's the guy that steps into that role that that J.R. Reed really carried this year. But we've got so much talent uh, in in the secondary and we've we've played a number of guys. Um, They they continue. They are very well coached. They're they're disciplined. They understand the system that we're trying to run. There's no changes on that end. Um, when you look at the guys that we've got coming back and the consistency we've had on that side of the ball with uh, with the schemes that we run and what we want to do, uh, I just think we continue to catapult even with with losing some guys. That you know, you, you go back uh, and you look at some of the the amazing talent that we've lost off the defensive side of the the, the football, especially going back to the year where we got to the national championship game. Um, and not as well known, maybe not some superstars coming out of this group, but the way they played together in such a cohesive manner, uh, I think we just continue to see that. I think, you know, and one other thing about uh, Richard, and, and we've all seen it because we at least get to go out to practice a little bit. Coach Smart has ridden that kid pretty hard the first <laughs> two years, and a lot of it was warranted. I, I'm not saying yeah. he did it, but Coach Smart expects that out of him, and I think he's finally – seeing the production and seeing that leadership that he always knew Richard had, but sometimes you got you got to push those guys out of high school and, and get them going in the right direction. And, and, and Richard's responded. KB didn't, uh, 
didn't didn't Richard have that uh, game clenching uh, interception uh, in New Orleans? Uh, yeah, right at the end of the game. It was yeah, where he almost yeah. jumped in the it stands. The Ran right by Kirby and over to the stands. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's always good. I, I you know I I always responded to coaches challenging you, and I, I think best players do. They don't get offended by it. They they know that these coaches expect more out of them, and that's how you make great players. Well, I'm flipping to the. Yeah, we uh, just saw uh, we just saw Jake uh, run it inside the ten. Took a pretty good lick there at the end of the play. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that and his uh, his lack of running last year? He didn't he didn't uh, he didn't pull the ball out of the belly and keep it too much. No, we didn't, and, and a lot of that was probably by by design. You know, you look at the skill set of, of Jake Fromm, and I think Jake Fromm is, and and the, the dogs at least on on my TV screen. DeAndre Swift just punched it in, uh, uh, pending the extra point here, tie it, tie it up. A great catch by Lawrence Cager. But you, know, you you look at the strength of a of a Jake Fromm, and it's it's really his intelligence, his leadership, uh, his ability to 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 throw the football and make every throw down the field. He's not a guy that's going to go go run it, and you know systematically we we did we gave a lot of of uh, of the the RPO looks, um, but just not one that uh, he, he's really going to be much of a threat in running the football. Uh, I think that changes this year with a new offensive quarter co coordinator coming in, and uh, you know a, a new quarterback coming in that it, at least from what we can tell and watch us the tape and what he's done done previously and Jamie Newman has got a skill set to go do that I think it's gonna uh going to open us up offensively and give us some new weapons um but definitely one last year that uh teams knew he was not going to pull the ball out of the belly of of his running backs and try to hurt you so they're able to crash with that backside defensive end and and, and listen it, it it limits what you can do in the running game if you're going to run that kind of style offense and you don't have that as a weapon for sure. We saw you know, uh, Andrew Thomas, Thomas too on that lead play for Swift to get in the end zone. And he, he showed as much emotion at the end of that play that I think we saw all season as he was, he had a terrific block on the linebacker to get Swift across the goal line. They, they just showed Solomon Kinley uh, being carted off there too, Scott. Now I was going to say, I just kind of, fill people in a little bit on the kind of the behind the scenes thing. I, I'm really enjoying this because first time I've gotten a chance to see the game from up top, you know, I'm down there on the sideline and it's tough when things are on the, I stand near that medical tent uh, yeah. with team doctors. So I can, because that's mostly what you guys are coming to me to look for is the, the latest on injury situations. And sometimes it's hard to see these guys are so big when I'm trying to see to the other end of the field, it's tough for me to see what really happened. But I see Solomon Kenley coming off, being carted off there. And I was thinking, you know, just so what people understand, a lot of times, you know, we're told what the situation is down there. But HIPAA law uh, requires that we get any official information has to come from Ron Corson, who's the director of our team medicine, uh, through the uh, sports information department to me that, that I can relay then, you know, on the air. And so a lot of times we're just given bare minimums, even though I may know differently during the course of the game, but I still can only say, well, he's out for now, or he's, you know, it's a right shoulder or exactly, you know, what the injury is. The, the HIPAA laws just prevent us from doing that. Yeah, mom's the word on on most of the injuries. You just, like you pointed out, it's, uh, is he in or is he out? Or is he able to go back or is, you know, that's about the uh, the most detail we're allowed to have anymore. Now, now it'll be, did he test positive or is he negative? <laughs> guys, Coach Smart's here in the uh, chat now. You can welcome him in. What's up, guys? Uh, All right, we've got uh, Kirby. Coach Kirby Smart is uh, joining us somewhere. I don't see him on my screen, but uh, I'm told he's with us somewhere. Coach, I see you guys. Scott, Eric, everybody's here, huh? Yeah, we are. Chuck, Kirby, how you doing, buddy? Hey. You doing okay? Everybody safe with the family? Y'all hanging in there? Yeah, everybody's great, man. Enjoying today uh, best we can. I'd much rather be in Sanford Stadium with about 100,000 friends, but it'll make do. <laughs> At least I know the outcome to the game. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Not quite as nerve-wracking, is it? Amen. 
<laughs> Coach, I, I remember having to chase you down here going in at, at, at halftime. But when I got to you, you were pretty confident going in at halftime. You, you felt pretty good about this. Well, I felt like we were playing good football. You know, we didn't get a lot of points off of it. We were able to move the ball. We were struggling to run the ball. And they were doing a really good job playing downhill. Uh, you know, they kind of came into the game with uh, some bad stats in rushing defense. So I think, you know, it was like uh, they had a lot of pride in stopping the run. And we thought it would be that way. You know, we kind of came out with a plan that we got to get them loosened up, space them out some. We weren't able to get some explosive plays we needed, but we were playing good defense. And I felt like our best plays were still in our kind of cupboard and we were waiting to let them out. You guys really jammed up their run, Kirby. I mean, they only ran it 14 times in the ball game. Did that surprise you at all? Well, it certainly didn't feel like that they were going to come in and try to do that the whole time. I mean, everybody's stubborn with it at times, but with their quarterback, and I think after the game, you know, and after looking back, talking to their their coordinator, he, he had no intention of uh, trying to run against those big guys in the middle, Jordan and those guys. So the sooner you can figure that out and the sooner you make them one-dimensional, it certainly makes things easier. But they had a really nice plan early with some play actions, getting the ball to the tight end on some crossing routes. They did a really good job of that. Coach, can you address the atmosphere that night and what it meant to recruiting? Yeah, it was by far our best recruiting uh, weekend of the entire year. I mean, all the way through uh, January, it was the best weekend by far. Just the electricity in the stands, obviously the lights, the atmosphere, um, the fact Notre Dame's there for the first time. It was really incredible. We, we, it impacted our recruiting last year probably more than anything else because every kid that was there uh, kind of fell in love with the place, and that's a credit to our fans. Coach, the uh, fourth game of the year, you, you bring Notre Dame in there. How tough was it that week to kind of keep your, your group just holding them back a little bit? Because it was so built up. It was the national game. How tough was it for you and your staff that week? Well, it's always, I mean, it's a challenge in these kind of games. I mean, it's easier to motivate because they get motivated. It's more, you know, holding them back and putting the collar on them. And I think the more relaxed you are, the more confident you are in those kind of games, it plays out in your favor. You know, it's always the, the lesser opponent that's tougher because you're trying to motivate them for that. But th this game was, was relatively easy, keeping them harnessed. I know our guys were really excited. Uh, the atmosphere made it easy. You know, the juices were there. The big things there just – taking the anxiety away from the players best you can. Mm -hmm. right, Coach, tell me about a screen where you are, Kirby. Can you see the, the game right now or no? No, I'm not, I'm not actually watching. No, I was thinking it would mess me up, but I know it's going on. I, I, I shut down the Twitter for a second and then going to go back on. But we're in the, we're in the final two minutes of the first half and Notre Dame oh, yeah. driving. And if, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts about what you remember then they, they came down and got a field goal right before the half. Yeah, they did a good job. They hit us on a seam route, a four vertical route there that they hit uh, Richard LeCount on. We're in three deep zone. They had a good call for it. Uh, Richard had that tied in and kind of stared at the quarterback. They hit him for a big play. Um, they had they got a little momentum going there with the, the hurry up uh, and started moving the ball on us, had success with that. Uh, we had a big red area stop, but you know it gets an interesting dynamic right here at the end because we always try to save our timeouts. So we have our timeouts, and at some point, you're not saving them for the offense. You're just trying to use them. Um, so it became a little bit of a chess match with uh, Brian there, trying to decide whether he was going to take a shot at the end zone, what he was going to try to do. You felt like he was going to take a shot at the end zone there a couple of times. We called timeout to see their formation. And uh, one time we called timeout just because we wanted to show them a different look on the field goal block because we, we didn't want them to know what we were going to do. Well, lo and behold, he decides to take the offense back out instead of kick the field goal. So now we're thinking, man, now he's going to try to go for it. We just wanted to protect the fade ball, stay out of press man, make them throw it up, throw it out of bounds, and just see their formation. Coach, we've seen a number of these uh, uh, false starts on the part of Notre Dame here in the first half. That, that crowd really does help, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. The crowd helps anytime you can get that. I mean, that has a major impact on the game. When, you, when you're playing first to 15 or you're fourth and one and now you're fourth and six, that's a major impact on the game. Coach, talk to me a little bit or talk to us a little bit about this defense and the progression that they that they made. We, we've had great defensive units underneath you, obviously a lot of great talent. Um, maybe no superstars necessarily on this team last year defensively like we've had historically, but I, I don't know if I've ever seen a defensive unit play as sound and as aggressive and physical 
throughout the course of a season, the way the way we saw this Georgia defensive unit. What do you attribute that to? Well, first thing I attribute it to is some really good players. Second is a good plan. Our, our coaching staff, Dan, Shu, Trey, and Charlton have got a great relationship. They really do a good job of teaching the players the plan each week. And it's different week to week. You know, you play different quarterbacks. I mean, there's some of them you want to get out of the pocket. There's some of them you want to keep in the pocket. But each week, that plan has been really uh, well done, and it's been executed. We've got answers when we struggle, like the tight end, you know, first half we struggled with. We came back and played some three buzz in the second half where we buzzed the safety down strong where the tight end was, and it created somewhat of a, a double team on him. So we got answers. we got good players. Um, as long as we motivate them and keep them playing hard and buying in, they, they kind of did that. And that was the big thing that carried over throughout the rest of the year. Well, did, did they ever? And, and fast forward into this year, uh, obviously not being able to get the team together. We've got a uh, new offensive coordinator coming in, new quarterbacks that are, that are, that are going to be, you know, in the mix here that are going to be competing for a job. A lot of new guys that are going to be counted on, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I, I know as I get asked the, the question, you know, how challenging is this that you're not going to get reps? And I, I think it's immensely challenging. Um, I, I know there's concern there. Is there any way to mitigate that in a situation where you've got to be on your own and, and, and try to work? Do we get there just through mental rep and, and mental rep or anything specifically you're working on during this unchartered time to, to mitigate some of that challenge? We're trying everything we can, um, you know, everything we can legally. And, and a lot of that comes into, you know, saying, hey, here's your homework. You know, you come into a meeting and you've got four hours of meeting. They just upped our meeting time from four hours a week to eight hours a week, but then we turn around and lose that because we've got final exams and we're not allowed to do anything with them a week prior to final exams or during final exams. So what they gave us, we kind of got taken away. So it's very unique. I think uh, Coach Munkin, uh, you know, Buster's working with Coach Munkin. They're putting together a good plan of installation, uh, verbiage, terminology. We've got some tests that we give them. Uh, we make them do a video, you know, a video of themselves. Say, hey, go out, walk out, be quarterback, take a snap count. That's your homework. You got to do a snap count. You got to do a cadence. You got to do a check. But you all know, you know as well as anybody, Eric. That ain't the same. <laughs> that ain't the same as a six foot five, two hundred and forty pound linebacker screaming down at you. And you got to throw hot. You just can't simulate that. So it's really bad timing for us. Like if you, know, if you had Jake back in this situation, you'd be thinking, man, I'm at a huge advantage. It's just the opposite uh, for us because we don't really know what we have. You know, when you, when you evaluate our quarterbacks, you look at it and you say, I got a guy that's had a major surgery. I got a guy that just came out of high school. I got a guy that's been as number two last year, Stetson. And then I've got a, a, a transfer from a, a wake that we don't know a lot about as far as in our system. So we got a lot of unknowns at that position. Which it is. It just, it's so challenging. And, and you know, anytime that you just the verbiage and learning a new offense with all these guys that are coming in that are, that are new, that takes so much time, just getting in the huddle and being able to communicate the play very quickly to where you're not thinking about it and going through your head. It's, um, there, there's no question that uh, you, your entire staff, and and every one of these young men, they've got the work cut out for them because it's to get the muscle memory to play fast where you're not thinking about it. Um, boy, just quite a challenge. So uh, I, I know, like everything, you're going to be up to it, but uh, tough for these these young men for sure. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. We're the best we can. We, you know, you got to be simple. You got to do what you can do. I mean, if it come, becomes a situation where our span to get ready for the season is shrunk, I mean, we got to be smart. I mean, we can't. Yeah, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to. We got, we got good football players. I say it's really kind of come down to you guys, kind of changing your matrix on how to really break down the competition because you're not getting as much time on the field, you're not getting as much time in the classroom, you're not getting as much time eye to eye. And that's really where it comes down to. So that's it's a great challenge for you, Coach, but I know you guys will do the best you can. That's all you can yeah, do. Yeah, but this is where it pays off the kind of kids you signed. You know, I look back and say, man, if I'd known I was going to be in this situation, would I sign this guy or this guy? Because when you can lead and guide them, it's a lot different than when they got to do it on their own. It makes you kind of say, hey, I, I got to reinvest in the right kind of kids. Coach, uh, I, you just called time out to ice their kicker, and they had a shot of you on the sideline. I'm looking at you on my screen. It looks like there's a much heavier guy on that sideline that's sitting on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's no doubt there's been some weight cut out of these cheeks in the last uh, two, three weeks. So that's a good bit. The problem isn't losing it. The problem is uh, the, the keeping it off. Well, you're in a competition. Did you have the weigh-in today? 
We did. We had a huge weigh-in today, and it. Uh, I was very proud of myself. But out of uh, nine guys, I came in ninth. So if that doesn't tell you anything, if you lose six pounds in a week and you get ninth, you're playing the wrong team. <laughs> hey, guys, guys, just want to let you know, Rodrigo has joined us in the room here before Coach has to go back. What's up, oh, good. You look good, hey, Rod. Rodrigo. What's up, Coach, how you doing? I'm uh, good, man. You look great. I miss you. Oh, I miss you too, Coach. Man, I miss, I miss this game too. I love it. I know you drilled that 40 yard. It looked like it'd been good from 70. That thing hit halfway up the net when you drilled it. <laughs> I think that's still coming up though. I, I had it pretty solid. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Rodrigo, Rod, you what really had a you had a big game for Georgia in this one. You I think you scored eleven of the 20, 23 points. Uh, you know, what were what were what was your reaction to uh the setting uh for this ball game and uh, and how did you feel going in? Uh, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better setting. Um, this was, you know, one of the most incredible environments, one of the most incredible atmospheres that you could ask to be in. Um, you know, we, we set a new attendance record, had to put in some extra stands because, you know, Dog Nation was coming out in full force. Um, so you couldn't have asked for a better environment to play in. Um, and it was just a blessing to, to be a part of it and to be a part of such a great win. Coach, uh, I want to jump in here. I know you got to get back to live tweeting. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Coach, no great doubt. Thank you. y'all. Rod, Thanks, great everybody. to see you. Thank all y'all for the coverage. Y'all take care. Go dogs. Go yeah, dogs. Thanks, Coach. That's great. Notre Dame are going to try one more crack at the end zone here, and then they're we're almost at halftime. They're going to kick a field goal there, 10 to 7. Uh, Rod, what was, it, what was it like at halftime, if you can recall, uh, down 10 to 7 with, uh, with two more quarters to play? Um, you know, I just remember that, um, you know, Coach Mark told us all week that it was going to be a tough game and, and we were going to get their best shot. And I think we went in at halftime and, and, you know, when they were winning at the time, uh, I think that was kind of a little bit of a reality check for us. Uh, you know, they, they were giving us our best shot and they were throwing everything that they had, uh, you know, our way. And so I think it was just at that point that we kind of realized we were going to have to, you know, bear down and hunker down uh, and just make sure we gave our best in the second half to make sure we could come away with a win. Rodrigo, when you're watching it on television like this, uh, like it's on today, do you does it look different to you than it did when you were in the moment? Uh, I think, you know, I, I never really think about the cameras being on. Um, you know, when, when you're when you're on the field, obviously, you know, you're not really thinking about uh, about that kind of thing going on. But when I go back and watch a TV copy, you kind of see. Um, you know, you, you see the people are watching from from all around. Um, so I think that that's definitely kind of interesting to to have someone else's perspective of watching the game. Um, and for a for a kicker in particular, it's really nice to to get to see the kind of the little wire cam that comes down onto the field because I yeah. go back and watch the game so that I can look at my technique from that angle. Because mo- a lot of times it's closer than the the video cameras that we have available to, to us in our system. So. It's really it nice to go back and watch the TV copies because you've got that low camera that comes in and gets a really close-up shot. So it helps you then. Absolutely. Hey, Rodrigo, I know, well, first of all, congratulations on an unbelievable career. How exciting was it for you to kick off first that game? You know, Notre Dame, go ahead. And <laughs> usually, they, I think they won the toss and chose to take the ball, didn't they, Scott? Uh, you'll have to ask, uh, let's get it on guy. I don't remember. <laughs> I think they did, but you go out there and, and that, that stadium is as electric as it has ever been. Tell, tell us, tell people what it's like back then trying to get your breath and just do what you do. Great. And that's kicking it up in the stands. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, it's always an incredible feeling, um, when you get to go out and, and open up the game, especially uh, this game in particular, um, with so much kind of hype and, and excitement around it. Obviously, we went up there and and uh, and beat them a couple years ago, and so I think there was definitely a lot of anticipation for this game that a lot of people thought they were going to kind of give us some payback. Um, but you know, lining up for that opening kickoff is always an incredible feeling, um, and it's it's really important to just kind of remember to be in the moment and just remember to you know go out and do what you do, um, just keep your emotions in check. Uh, and, and after it sells for the end zone, then you kind of get a little bit excited. Right, and you, you brought it up. Notre Dame's going to have a special place in your heart when you think about your Georgia career because of you had the game-winning kick there. The scholarship announcement was made after that game, I believe. And right. then uh, last year with the three-for-three three kicks and 
and all your extra points, man, you racked it up against the Irish. <laughs> yeah, you know, just trying to go out and, and help the team win. Um, you know, anytime I get a chance to go out and uh, put points on the board, I'm obviously going to try and do that the best I can. And, um, you know, we've been very fortunate to be able to put out two good football games against them and, and stay undefeated against Notre Dame so far. Can Rodrigo, like, can you, Rodrigo well, the leprechaun slayer. I like <laughs> <laughs> Rodrigo, how about, like, can you talk a little bit, Rodrigo, about Kevin Butler and what he did for you? Oh, I mean, uh, I don't know if, if I have enough time to talk about Coach Butler, man. <laughs> Tell us all the bad <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I, no, think no, I, can no, I think no, I can no. jump in and tell the bad stuff. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave the, the bad stuff to me. Rodrigo, you just tell them the good stuff. Oh, well, I guess I guess I'll start with helmets on balls in the air. Um, that was that was Coach Butler's go-to. Um, anytime we got out on the field, even if the specialists were there before the rest of the team, it was always have your helmets on. You know, we got to get balls in the air. Just, you know, basically kind of telling us to get locked in. Um, you know, it's never too early to, to start honing in for practice or honing in for a game. Um, so, you know, it was always great to have just to kind of keep us going, um, you know, make sure that we were focused and, and ready to go for practice each day. Um, but Coach Butler has been so amazing for me and just helping me to develop mentally. Um, I think that that was really an aspect of my game that, you know, wasn't as far along as it, as it could have been at, at that point in my career when he, uh, you know, joined us in 2016. And so, um, you know, just over the, you know, over a couple of years that he was uh, been with me and been with our specialists, um, was just done an incredible job to help me develop mentally and, uh, you know, work on that aspect of my game so that I could become a more well-rounded specialist. Rod, how has that helped you, Rod, in, in this period of, uh, you know, getting ready for the next stage of your, of your career? The NFL draft is coming up. I mean, what have you been able to do as far as your preparation for all of this stuff? Uh, well, it's definitely been a little bit different than what anyone, you know, was expecting. Um, up until the combine, everything was pretty normal. Um, I went out to Birmingham and I was training with uh, one of my longtime kicking coaches, Mike McCabe. Um, I was doing some work with him out in Birmingham after the senior bowl leading up to the combine. But after the combine, things kind of took a took a big turn. Um, our, our pro day got canceled, I think, three or four days before we were supposed to have it. So we didn't have our pro day. And, you know, I haven't been able to have any uh, individual workouts. And for specialists, that's really kind of the bread and butter of uh, the draft process is getting to have in individual workouts and, uh, you know, get one on one with these special teams coordinators, because in those work workouts, they can, you know, put you through the ringer, they can have you do all the drills and, and stuff that they want to see um, before they make a decision on you. And we didn't get to have those this year. So, you know, for all the specialists this time around, uh, our, our career take, you know, that became a larger portion of the sample size compared to years past. Um, so it, it definitely wasn't great not being able to have that, but at the same time, I've just been trying to, you know, keep doing what I can do. Um, it's definitely kind of interesting trying to hedge your bets when you go out to the field and hope you don't get kicked off. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've had a couple of situations with uh, some Georgia guys so far in the process where they kind of got kicked off their fields, um, you know, so we're trying not to have that happen. So I'm, I'm going out a couple times a week out to our intramural field right now, uh, just trying to get my workout in without bothering anybody. And that's about <laughs> all anybody can do right now. Um, you know, I've got some, I've got some resistance bands and ankle weights and a balance ball that I can use at home to, to do some exercise and do some stuff to try and, you know, stay fit at home. Um, but outside of that, that's about all anybody can do right now. Well, Rodrigo, I know it's I know it's challenging and tough, but you're right. They're going to go back to your career tape, and uh, you, you've got you've had a career like few have ever had. So keep the faith as you go through this time period. Uh, you're a special talent. You've been special for Georgia for a long time, and, and others will see that as well. So keep the faith and and continue working hard, as I know you will. But when you when you look back on this career that that you've had, it's just been really remarkable you played in so many big games uh this being one of them the one that we're watching but are there any games that that just stand out for you in your mind that kind of rise above uh, maybe any of the other ones uh I, I think there's a couple um i think this game was was definitely up there um i i had a pretty good game um just in terms of you know my kicking and how i was able to contribute to the team uh, obviously the the atmosphere of the game uh definitely i think has a special place uh for me i think the national championship game a couple years ago was another one um that, that'll stand out for me 
And I, I think uh, Texas A&M this year as well, um, being our senior night, pouring rain in the first half, um, going out and being able to, you know, string a few good kicks together here and there um, to, to help us win that game as well. I think those are uh, definitely some very significant games in my career. Well, How about I, your 55-yarder in the Rose Bowl? 55-yarder in the Rose Bowl. I, the biggest oh, yeah. kick, I think your biggest kick of your career, Yeah. being from another kicker, is the 51-yarder in the championship game. Um, mm -hmm. That was a do-or-die kick. It kept Georgia in the game. And it was from 51 yards, which is no gimme. And you nailed it right down the middle. I think it was Coach uh, Cavan was sitting. I mean, he looked at me. He goes, "Is this a big kick?" I go, "This is the definition of a big kick." Right <laughs> <laughs> he always came through in fine colors. I've I've been able to um, be able to be around you, and, and it's been a pleasure. Um, you made it so much fun to go back to Georgia. Um, because you were such a weapon, you know, with Georgia kicking that ball out of the end zone every time. I don't know people really realize what a big play that is. Uh, and you did it better than anybody's ever done it at the university. Just like Eric said, you know, your film and what you've done is your tryout. I spoke to about four different personnel directors around the NFL this year asking about you and, you know, what, what do you say? He, he's the hardest worker I've been around. He's a great young man. He's a team player and he makes kicks and wins games. Um, and that's what you need to do as a kicker. And you're going to have a great career. And it's, uh, it's going to be fun for all of us to talk about you on Saturdays and get to watch you on Sundays. Thank you so much, coach. I appreciate it. Well, the, uh, the game has been halted momentarily a uh, Blaylock uh, they tried to make a catch and they went to a review and I, I believe they called that incomplete, right? Was that, was yeah, that the confirmation? They, Ball hit the ground. I think they did a little inside post against uh, cover two that uh, ball was thrown just a, just a hair low and uh, Dom Blaylock tried to go down and get it. But if memory serves, I, I think it did hit the, uh, hit the ground. So the ball just under thrown just a, just a hair as the dogs are trying to get back into this right now, 10 to seven, uh, just a few minutes here, four minutes, three and a half minutes or so uh, into the start of the, the second half. So obviously a big drive for the, for the dogs in this football game. Rod, you had the only points of the, of the third quarter for Georgia, but uh, you had two field goals, one that tied the game and then one that gave us our first lead. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, just anytime that I can, anytime that I can come in and help, um, I'm going to want to do that. Um, you know, regardless of the situation, regardless of who we're playing against, um, you know, I just want to be able to go out and, and treat every situation the exact same way and uh, just trust that that's going to lead to be able to put points on the board to help our team win. That's awesome. Men, you guys have a great day. I've got to head out uh, and, oh, you know, there's no team what? that has two kickers. So you've got right <laughs> to go. what, let me Let me get this right. You're going out to play golf, aren't you? No, no. You know what? I, I was at the uh, I was at my wife's bridal store all day handing out bride uh, dresses. So oh. <laughs> still got to wedding dresses. Kevin, it was great seeing you. Tell the family hello for us, please, and stay safe. Don't touch your face. Bulldog Nation, take care. And Rodrigo, I'll be talking to you this week, buddy. Good luck. Yes, sir. Sorry, See you, Kev. Sorry. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you, guys. How are you going again? Sure. <laughs> We've got a few more folks that are going to join us. Uh, we're supposed to have Jeff uh, Dantzler coming up here in a few moments. And then uh, is this is the last guest a special guest or can I mention that? Sorry. I think you just have to just, tease uh, the last guest. I would say do not mention him. He's a special guest. And then we'll tease. Okay. So I'll, I'll tease. I'll say. <laughs> You'll want to stick around for the finish. We're going to be here till uh, roughly four o'clock. I guess I think the game no, five, will go another five, hour. I think we're going to go to five o'clock. We're going to go to five o'clock. We're going till five. Yes, yes. Somebody told me that. <laughs> <laughs> I got dinner plans. Ugh. I'm just kidding. I got nothing else to do. <laughs> we. I was going to say we. Rod. Rod was a journalism major. We can let him finish it out. <laughs> oh man, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds and, good. Your host Jeff, for the last hour will be Rodrigo Blankenship. How about that? <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Dantzler is joining us now, too. Jeff, you are on mute right now, so if you could unmute your mic. 
All right, they're in a commercial break for the break game. For the game. bring Jeff in. Go, Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Hey, guys, how's everybody today? Doing Good wonderful, good. Jeff. Hope you and your beautiful bride are safe and, and doing well. We are. I've got a – if I can pull him over here, we've got a little Albus here. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. With us. He's 10 pounds of fury, so uh, – <laughs> He looks it. Uh, but, yeah, this was uh, such a – such an unbelievable night, wasn't it? The atmosphere, when you think about everything that, that went into it for you know, Georgia to go out and pull out a win like this is one thing to get that atmosphere and get that kind of crowd, but then to get the win on top of it and to do it in such thrilling fashion. And it, it's truly a night that uh, all of us longtime Bulldogs will never forget. There's, We were talking about it, uh, you know, as we, we just kicked off. I don't know if I've – if I've ever seen the campus before the game for, for days before the game, a week before the game, have the kind of buzz that, that we had on campus there in Athens. And then you, you get into the game, the end game experience now. And, and Rodrigo, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. I've never seen anything like it. Obviously when I played now 20 plus years ago, nothing even close to this, but you get the led lights and, and, that they're flashing on and off and, and the stadium is glowing red. It, it's, I, I can't imagine playing in a game like that because I know just sitting in the booth and seeing that for the first time, it, it was, it was hard not to, uh, you, you had to fight back tears just because it was so uh, emotional being a part of, I've never seen anything like it. Couple that with playing a top 10 team in Notre Dame and the, the history and tradition of that after we went up, uh, to South Bend a couple of years earlier and beat them. It was the perfect storm to create something I've never seen in the game of college football. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, Coach Mar was was telling us all week, you know, don't play the game before it happens. Um, and, you know, I think what he meant by that is, you know, you can't, you can't get overexcited. You can't get over anxious during the week leading up to the game. You know, you, you don't want to drain yourself emotionally, um, you know, kind of putting all your emphasis on the game before it happens. You know, you want to kind of say – save everything that you've got until you actually step out on the field on Saturday. Um, and so I definitely think that, you know, it was a game, you know, comparable to the national championship in terms of just the, the raw excitement that our team had and just kind of the energy that we had getting ready for the game. Um, so it, there was definitely um, a very, very high profile game um, in that regard. And then, like you said, when we got out on the field and um, we had the new strobe lights going on, you know, with, when, a, when a big play happened or in between each quarter um, and then they did the red lights, uh, I'm in the fourth quarter after uh, Krypton. You know, I think that uh, that moment in itself, I think, was something I, I remember myself just having like a chill go down my spine when it happened. You know, the whole stadium went black uh, and then it lit up all red. And it was just one of the most insane moments that I could have ever, you know, hoped to be a part of. And, and, and it was truly an incredible moment. I think something that uh, that really kind of helped us, fueled us uh, going into that fourth quarter and, and helped us, you know, hold on to, get, to win the game. I don't know how you had any energy left at all, because if I would have been on the field and they would have shut the lights off and the stadium was glowing red, I would have been done. I would have been spent. <laughs> it would have been over. They just, we just saw, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the biggest plays of, of the game in that divide Wilson interception. Jeff, what do you, what do you remember about that play and, and how key was that to Georgia's success? Well, it, it was huge in that Georgia was able to capitalize on this and, and get uh, Rodrigo's field goal, and, and finally you catch him and then you take the lead. But a big reason Georgia wasn't able to pull away in this game, uh, Georgia had one turnover, Notre Dame got seven points off of that. The two turnovers that we got, we only got field goals out of that. We couldn't deliver that knockout blow, and obviously you have to give a lot of credit to Notre Dame for that. But you know this, this had all the – the attributes of a great game. You had big time players making big time plays. It was a back and forth game as far as the emotion and the energy went. And, and there's no question that when you look at the penalty yardage, when you look at when those penalties came, uh, the crowd at Sanford Stadium had an enormous hand in this victory for Georgia. I, I'm not sure if, if the dogs win this game, if it's played in South Bend, even though we had half the crowd up there in 2017. So this was certainly one, and, and I've, I've got another victory cigar right here. The, uh, the, the cigar <laughs> that, that, that I lit up for a victory after that one was sweet because just uh, for me, uh, being a Georgia fan my whole life, and, and when I'm coming up, Notre Dame was kind of at the tail end of their run as the, the premier program. And you just think 
uh, my goodness, would a team like Notre Dame ever come here and we beat them for the national championship and then to win by one point in South Bend and, and to win this game by six points here, you, know, you feel like it was certainly, uh, if not a once in a lifetime experience, it was certainly something that, that we probably won't experience for a long time. Yeah, speaking of that, Jeff, with, uh, you know, I, obviously we're in unprecedented times now. Um, and, and, you know, when you're when you're looking at uh, as we get through uh, all the things that we're getting through, do you think that we'll have up see Georgia stadiums like this again? We were talking about it a little bit earlier and uh, I know we don't know an answer, but, you know, kind of the, the prevailing thought there was this is such a part of life for so many people that when given the green light, boy, we're going to be back in droves. Do you think the same thing? Yes, uh, it, it, it might be a question of when, but I, I believe we're going to have a football season this year. Uh, it just means too much to too many people. The, the economic impact uh, for every college town in America, for every athletic department, for the university, for the hotels, for the restaurants, uh, if there's no football, I mean, you're talking about bankrupting every college town in America. So at some point, I think we're going to have it. Now, is it going to look this season the way it has in years past? Maybe, maybe not. Now, at some point, you know, I would say by 2021, we're going to get back to, to full on everything that we've enjoyed for, for decade after decade, going back for the last century. Things might look a little bit different right now, but I think now is a time where, where good ideas and hope are good things. I really like what Major League Baseball has talked about, taking all the teams down to the Phoenix area and playing there. Uh, what the NBA has talked about, potentially uh, having their playoffs, put all the teams in Las Vegas and playing in the arenas there. So these are the types of ideas that we need. And, and I also think just some good patience, listen to the really smart people, and let that guide us to the decisions we make. And uh, maybe we don't kick off on Labor Day night. I don't know. I, I hope we will, and I certainly think there's a chance we will. But there is no doubt in my mind that we're going to have college football this year. And, and guys, I'll, I'll just one more thought to throw in there. I think we can all agree on this. When there are bad times, good lessons can be learned from that. And I know one thing for me is not taking anything for granted. And I think back uh, earlier this week, we had the one year anniversary of our 20 inning victory over Clemson in baseball. And, and that night, Dave Johnson and I were, were sitting in the booth going, oh, they got to change these rules for these midweek games. <laughs> uh, just put a runner on second, starting in the 10th inning. I would give anything in the world right now to be at Foley Field calling a 20 inning game. So I think for all of us, Amen when we that. get back to doing what it is that, that we love, we are going to savor every single second of it. And I can't wait. JD, along those lines, you know, you're exactly right. And I was just thinking, you know, right now, time is our ally. We, we are, as we sit here now, we're nine weeks away from the first day of summer. That's, that's time, you know, and, and we have seen so much happen over the past nine weeks that if, if we are, in fact, turning the, the corner here and starting to see light at the end of the tunnel, maybe that light will be shining bright enough by the first day of summer that we can start to think about guys getting back into camp in August and a season in September. Yeah, no doubt about it, Chuck. And, you know, I think we all knew April was going to be rough. So my thinking was kind of April's going to be hard. Uh, May can be the buffer. And then in June, we can start to see the light. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we're beginning to start to see the light right now. And, you know, the other big thing we got to get going, it's clear, we've got to get school back started. And that, that, you know, starts at every level. But but getting the kids back on campus, obviously grade school kids. And I know we've all – my wife Emily is, is a teacher, so she's been teaching from home. And uh, I know uh, uh, there have probably been some parents who've had their kids at home who've expelled a couple of their children and sent them to the principal's <laughs> office. <laughs> yeah, we just, we've got to get the engine going back again. And, and I really, really do believe that we will. And, and I think when we get it back, we're, we're going to see a boom of everything because we're going to be excited. There he is. Look at, that little, look at that little stud right there. Let me tell you, listen, if you ever need any gossip on your dad, I can tell you about some nights at Gus Garcia's when we were in college. That'll get you off the hook. <laughs> Say yes, sir. I'll call you soon. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
stuff. But no, I, I, I just, I think, so again, when we get there, we're, we're going to all be so excited to get it back. And one of the things about sports, you just look at so many uh, different periods in our history, especially in the 20th century, sports is the great unifier. I mean, I mean, how many people has sports brought together? And, and guys, we can all think about it the number of people that come to Athens for Georgia football weekends. And as we've all gotten older, it's people you don't see near as much as they used to. And for so many people, now we all work in the game, but for so many people, sports is their release. It's their escape. It's their distraction from, from what we call the real world and grown up jobs there. So we got to get that back. We got to get the games going again. And, and I have no doubt that we will. And I, I just can't wait for that first Saturday when we all get to reconvene between the hedges. Well, this game that we're watching this afternoon has gone to 10-10, Rod, with a 40-yard uh, field goal to tie it. Play prior to that, we just missed, uh, guys, uh, if, you, if you were able to see it, that uh, from to uh, D-Rob pass just off his fingertips with a man on him in the end zone. That was and still pass interference. And yes. And tied it up at 10. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was absolutely pass interference. I, I still <laughs> that, that wasn't called. Even even right now, I almost started screaming into the uh, computer screen here. I think we – I you know, I went back and watched this game a little bit earlier this week, and uh, the TV guys were – you know, the main thing they keep going to, and they bring in uh, – they bring in their official – Hey, honey. Uh, Gene, whatever his name is. I'm sorry, I don't know his last name. Uh, but they bring him in for um, – uh, referral or you know his opinion uh, and they always talk about well the, the defender never looked back at the ball you know but then he's got his arms and he's making contact and all that and and then they kind of talk themselves out of the fact that he wasn't looking back to make a play on the ball and his all this stuff is just kind of incidental contact and it was okay well, to, to quote the greatest bulldog ever, Dan McGill, George ain't never lost uh, if we hadn't been hurt or cheated. Well, uh, thank <laughs> you. We wound up pulling this one out. And, uh, yeah, there are always some shaky calls. Now, guys, think about this. I mean, how about in 2017? If it's not for replay, that's an incomplete pass to Terry Godwin, and that's a kickoff return for a touchdown for Notre Dame. So when the guy was down three different ways – so instead of being tied 10 to 10, you know, we'd have been down 17 to 6 in that game. So you, know, you always heard stories through the years. And, and heck, even with replay, we got cheated in the national title game. And obviously the, the false start, the, the non-offsides penalty, DeAndre Swift getting yanked down by the face mask, Fromm's helmet getting shoved into the ground, no call there. But it kind of always the thinking was if you went to South Bend or if you played Alabama, you had to win by 14 to win by three. So I, I think one thing with replay that, that it would be nice for us to get to would be just to go to a challenge system, whether it's two or three, and, and you can challenge pretty much anything uh, that happens because when replay was put in, it was put in to prevent egregious errors from affecting the outcome of the game. But we've gotten too bureaucratic into what should be and could be reviewed as opposed to making sure the calls are right. Yeah, no, I think good points there. And, and one thing, the just before you got on, Jeff, Coach Smart was on. And uh, if you remember the first half of this football game, Komet, the, the, the great Notre Dame tight end, really hurt us a lot. We were playing a lot of two high safeties. And um, uh, Coach Smart mentioned one of the adjustments. Uh, you just saw it. We're in a commercial break right now in the game. But you just saw that adjustment made uh, uh, in, in real time there or just in, in the game there. Uh, where J.R. Reed came down in a three-buzz situation uh, where you had a little lion route, a little quick out route by Komet, the tight end. Uh, J.R. Reed almost picks that one off, but um, great adjustments for Georgia all year long, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, that was a great example we saw right there of an adjustment that Georgia made uh, against a tight end that, that tore us up quite a bit there uh, early in the football game. Um, but the adjustments that we were able to make especially on the defensive side of the ball all last year. Pretty impressive. Great example of it there. But uh, just talk about that, J Jeff, this defense and how well we played last year. But you're, you're as great a historian of Georgia football as, uh, you know, outside of Lauren Smith, that put you two guys up on the pinnacle of, of knowing more about Georgia football than anybody else around. Uh, have you seen a defense like the University of Georgia last year in the way that we played? 
I, I think when you talk about uh, the talent, I think when you talk about the depth, about the way that they're coached, you know, it would take you back to the junkyard dog days with the great Irk Russell and then going back into the early 1980s. Now, obviously, the game is played so much differently now in that you've got – you know, you watch a game from back in the 70s, or early 80s, there'd be 13 or 14 guys that play on either side of the ball. And now, you know, they're 19, 20 guys who played by the second or third possession on each side. But I think Kirby and his staff are so good at the adjustments and just kind of painting with the broad brush with football. The first half is about, about preparation and the second half is about the adjustments. And Georgia was incredible at making the adjustments. And, you know, I think if, if there's one play – where it also showed, along with the adjustments that Georgia made, how well coached Georgia is. It was on Notre Dame's last play uh, when the dogs went with Jermaine Johnson and Nolan Smith, knowing that, that we had to get pressure on Book. And one of the biggest keys, both of those guys kept containment. They didn't overrun the play because for a guy like Ian Book, he's a great quarterback. He's doubly dangerous when he's able to get around that end, buy himself some time, receivers are coming back to him. So I really thought that last play, what Smith and Johnson were able to do was a microcosm of just how magnificent this Georgia defense was in every facet this past season. Yeah. Johnson almost had him too. Oh, he sure did. And, you know, that's when you're talking about a guy like that being a, a second stringer, it's – it's absolutely incredible. And I think as we look ahead now, when you look at some of the players that Georgia has, like Aziz Ojolari, Trayvon Walker, Monty Rice, you know, it's going to be hard to get those guys off the field. And, Eric, kind of going back to what you were talking about with the adjustments, I felt like the next week at Tennessee, when we started going with more of that consistent four-man front when Aziz was lining up more as a defensive end consistently, I really thought that Georgia's run defense uh, was I – mean, it was good the whole time. But I thought having to deal with, you know, wh whether it was Herring, Walker, uh, Jordan Davis, uh, whoever uh, on the defensive line, and then you throw in Ojolari up there, that was going to be a load for any five offensive linemen. And, and Komet, you know, you know, Chuck, Scott, you, you guys saw it too. And Komet was just killing us. If Georgia doesn't make those adjustments, I'm not sure we win the game. We just saw uh, Notre Dame with another penalty. And, and Brian Kelly, he, he had his dander up most of the night. He was – he looked like a basketball coach on the sidelines more than a football coach, the way he was wearing out the, uh, the, <laughs> the line judge on that side of the field. Um I mean, he was he was in the officials' ears pretty much all night long. He and made, I, go ahead, Scott. He, he he talked about not about the officiating, but about what an impact that the crowd had. You know, that made it so difficult for them. Well, and it showed just when you look at the penalty yardage there, and and how significant it was, and uh, just the effect that the Georgia crowd had, and. I think to, to kind of quote Obi-Wan Kenobi, there's a symbiotic relationship between a team and a crowd. And when the crowd is rolling, the players feed off of that. And when the players are playing great and making big plays, the crowd feeds off of that. And I think we saw this throughout this game and kind of with the, the, the re-energization of the program here uh, since Kirby came on board and, and really – we think about that win at Notre Dame and how that just felt like one of those games that, golly, you know, years past, we might have come up just short and we're saying what if, but it felt like when we won that game that that opened things up and we all said, wow, this really feels different now. And then the, the way we pummeled Mississippi State and, uh, you know, the, the two games that really kind of uh, my, my afternoon co-host Chris Brame and I talk about this a lot that really kind of took it to that next level. But after those wins over Notre Dame and Mississippi State, to go up to Knoxville and Nashville, win 41 nothing, and then that game in Nashville in 2017. Now, we're coming off a blowout of Tennessee. We've beaten Notre Dame. We've beaten Mississippi State. 11 a.m. kickoff. That's one of those when you're just praying to pull it out late. And we went out and, and pummeled them. And, and that's a thing, too. When you look at the, the margin of victory that we were able to get, and those 17 and 18 teams, so we won 24 games, 22 of them were by at least 14 points. 
the two that weren't were against two decent programs, Notre Dame and Oklahoma. So that, that, that set a pretty high bar. Now, this past year, we didn't have that margin of victory. What we were able to do in November, that run is one of the best I've ever seen in the history of Georgia football. It, it was a great season. This was certainly a highlight, but I think, unfortunately, just the attrition that we had, uh, especially at the skill positions, especially at wide receiver, and then the injuries that we had there, we were just never really able to get up to full speed and running because you think about when Cager got hurt against South Carolina, then when he came back, that was just when Pickens and Blaylock were getting into the fold. And we never really had all three of those guys going full speed at the whole time, but we still come up with a year where we beat Florida, Auburn Tech, Tennessee, Texas A&M, we beat Notre Dame and win the Sugar Bowl. It was an incredible year. And Jeff, add, you talk about the injuries there. Add to that the, the injury to DeAndre Swift where he just couldn't go right. full speed, right? And, and you know, you, you think about this, this, LSU was a, a dominant football team last year. I, I think that they, if, if we play them 10 times, uh, and and we are full full go. We we may win three of them last year with the with the teams that we had. But uh, we had opportunities even in that SEC championship game. A and you think if we had our full contingency of of talent on the field, that game could be completely different. The first play of the game that could end up being a touchdown, and who knows where it goes uh, after that. But but I I 100% agree with you. The injuries and the attrition. When you look at the gauntlet that we had to go through in the month of November, I, I really can't think of another another season that the dogs had had where you had to go that kind of, of competition week in and week out. And it absolutely can wear you down. It's why playing in the SEC is different, uh, especially when you get a, a run of teams like that. It's no different than playing in the NFL where you get done with the game and it takes you the entire week to get your body prepared and then mentally prepared to go play in a game the following week. That's what that, that month was for the dogs. And so, I, I'm sitting, I'm, so I'm sitting here watching Jake Fromm just go to Cager after pass after pass to Lawrence Cager. And your boy just really hits you about how much we really miss that guy. That's that's spot on. And you think with, with Cager too, if we have him the full time, and as I said, kind of starting with that Florida game, that's when Pickens and Blaylock get into the fold. Because you think about that run there in November, Blaylock caught touchdowns against Florida, Auburn, and Tech. Pickens scored touchdowns against Missouri, Texas A&M, and Tech, and against LSU. But again, we never had our three best guys healthy and together really clicking at once. I, I think another thing that, that happened last year, as awful as that loss to South Carolina was, it, it's certainly one of the most disappointing ones we've ever had. You know, it set up dangerously. They were off the week before. We were on the road with a night game. It was an early kick here. Uh, there, there were some funny things that, that happened. And, and give them credit. They played great, and we had a bad day. I, I thought the biggest key to us regrouping were the circumstances under which we had to win the Kentucky game. That was a nasty night. Uh, it Ooh. was with the weather, the team, you know, was limited. Both sides were limited with the weather. The, the fans got antsy. It was just an ugly night. But the fact that we were able to pull that game out and that we had to fight to do it, to really pull out all the stops to win that game, uh, to me, that was the best thing that happened to this team for the run in the second half. I think if it's just a beautiful 65 degree night and we go out and win 38 to seven, it's like, eh, everything's okay. We just had a bad day, but that kept everybody on edge heading into that open day. And then starting with the win over Florida, we were really off and running. I really think until the day I die, I'll, I'll, I'll go down believing that the toughness of that win over Kentucky keyed that surge in November. Hey, Jeff, I want to jump in here. Thanks very much for joining us. we got to make some room for some other guests. We appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Z. Hot Rod, good to see you. You guys uh, can't wait to get back to, to Sanford Stadium. Go dogs. Go dogs. See you, Go Jeff. Dogs, Stay safe. Thanks, boys. Guys, just so you know, uh, real quick, Hot Rod will be back with us. He had to stop off, get a little lunch, and he will be back with us. All right. Uh, 
one of the things, guys, that uh, we're watching right now, they got to a stopping point. Georgia, I believe they're, they're getting ready to take the lead here with another rod kick, but uh, <laughs> they're showing on the screen right now uh, the Notre Dame guys because we were moving so fast and rapidly down the field, and this happened multiple times during the game with the injuries. Uh, you know, I mean, we just saw the play where uh, uh, one of the Notre Dame guys in the secondary just – uh, pulled down the linebacker and, and, and put him on one knee to stop his offense from going down the field. And, uh, you know, everybody in the stadium caught on to that in a hurry. Yeah, just just blatant. And there's, you know, hopefully people are taking a look at that, right? I mean, and, and the, the rules in place, if you're truly injured, I get it, right? The safety of the players has got to be paramount. Um, but But there were a couple of times where it was just blatant. And it happened to us, not just in this football game, but throughout the year in a number of yeah, games yeah. at any time, almost back-to-back -back games, where anytime we got some momentum going on the offensive side of the ball, uh, guys were uh, opposing players were, were laying down. Uh, and just like that, if, if you're watching the, uh, the, the replay of the game, it, it's just blatant where uh, a teammate comes and just rips somebody down to the ground and says, stay down and, and, and don't move. Uh, that, that's got to be, that's got to be seen and, and really put a stop to because it disrupts. It disrupts the game. Guys, guys, real quick, side Scott. Side. I, I know I know. for us, you know, in the booth, I mean, it it irritates the stew out of me. I mean, it makes me mad. I'm just I'm just calling the game. But I can imagine if you're if you're down there and you're invested in it on the sidelines as a coach or or a player, that just makes you want to blow your stack. Scott, not to interrupt you here, but we have a special guest joining us from uh, South Georgia today. Uh, a good boy. Uh, well, please welcome Uga. I'm not sure how many questions you can get in and how much he'll answer, but he, he's here and happy to join us. All right. Uga 10 Where's, is here. Where's Uga? Oh, he's looking good. Chuck, his, if you, uh, sweater. Chuck, if you, in your upper right, in your upper right of your screen, if you click yeah. gallery view, you will see Uga. I'm back. And Rod <laughs> is back as, well. back as well, too. Time for a field goal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Just in time. <laughs> And Uga's here to cheer you on. Oh, I love that. And Uga is That's looking awesome. good. He's got his Uga's got his jersey on. He's got his his black jersey in the background too. Not sure if the uh, if the black jersey is ever going to make an appearance again, but but Uga is representing. He's just showing him. off now. Like, That's right. Like that. Uh, there he is. It's time for uh, dog fans to get their uh, get their screenshots of Uga since we didn't have that meeting time with him at G Day today. You can oh, yeah. get your uh, Christmas card photos now, I guess, if you can get a screenshot of that. <laughs> there you go. Look right into the camera. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure Charles 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 Siler's probably probably handling him there. We we I've, we've asked him a couple of questions, but I think he must be on mute because I don't think he's responding. Uh oh. <laughs> That's great to see, though. I know everybody uh, misses seeing that, at least over the last two or three weeks for spring football. But uh, it's great to see Uga Ten here with us today. Yeah, he is. He is looking good right now, posing for the camera for sure. Hey, we're here. If you can hear me, I don't. I don't know. We, I didn't know if we were supposed to say anything or not. There he is. There we go. There's Charles. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for being on with us today, Charles. Glad to be here. Actually, I'm watching the game. This is the first time I've seen the replay. Oh, You're going to like the outcome. <laughs> yeah, it's always best to watch the replay when you know the outcome. Hey, Charles, i got to ask you, how's how's Uga handling the quarantine? He, he's okay. He's, he's not – this is – we're actually in his room, and it also is where my son plays Fortnite, and uh, my son's <laughs> about to wait – about to, to rub the buttons off of that control. <laughs> I know what you're talking about, Charles. I'm I'm using the room where my son does that, so I've I've put him out of commission for about three hours. That's right. That's Hot Rod, we just saw your right field there. goal, buddy. Oh yeah, right down the middle, yeah. just how I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rod, you just gave us the lead. That's right. Hey, uh, Rod, let me ask you something about, uh, you know, you hear everybody talk about halftime adjustments. We were 
you were with us right at the end of the first half. Uh, and we go in, we're down 10 to seven. Are there actual adjustments that are, that are, that are made or what, what's the nomenclature? How would you call it as a player in the locker room? And you, you're, you're trying to change things up from to the second half from what you did in the first half is, is uh, halftime adjustments. Is that overrated or is that actually what happens? No, no, it's uh, definitely not overrated and halftime adjustments definitely do happen. Um, most of the time I'm, I'm not in there for, uh, for a majority of them, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll go in and I'll do some of my uh, meditation, um, when I come back and then the specialists usually head back out early so we can, you know, get warming up for the second and half starts. But, um, when, when I have been in there, uh, there definitely are some adjustments that go on. Um, you know, we, we split, we split our team, our team up into offense and defense on either side of the locker room. Uh, and then the coaches just start, you know, breaking it down, you know, they start going over, you know, stuff that maybe the other team burned us on in the first half and, you know, how to make the correction um, so that it doesn't happen again, um, you know. And, and so that, that kind of thing is, uh, um, you know, it's going on for pretty much all of halftime. And, and I really believe that the coaching staff does a great job of, of recognizing those things um, and making the adjustments necessary to go out and be better in the second half. Um, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, you know, our, our team typically uh, plays better on the second half. You know, towards the end of the game, uh, it seems like we just get better and, and get stronger. And it's because our coaches make some amazing adjustments at halftime so, so that, uh, you know, our team knows what to look for going down the stretch. Rod, you've probably answered this on a, on a number of occasions, but I, I'm really curious. Could you walk me through your thought process on the shoes you were going to wear before a game? Because I was so superstitious. I, I had to put the same sock on first in, in the same exact way followed by wristbands and it was I could I, I couldn't vary at all in the way I prepared before any game I ever played on and and you would show up with with different color shoes quite a bit so so what was your thought process and and what shoes you were going to wear did superstition come in at all into into that in terms of boy I, I played really well the week before there's no way I'm changing right now what was that that thought process and getting ready for a game and how you chose your shoes you were going to wear? Yeah, um, so uh, I am very superstitious and my, my superstitions apply to lots of things. Uh, the shoes being one of them. Uh, I see I'm getting some words of advice from Coach Fountain right now. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I am, I'm very superstitious. My, my cleats are included. Um, up until this season, I was wearing the same uh, the same pair of cleats for every game. I call them the pink slippers. Um, it's a very old model of Nike shoes that have a cover on the laces, which I really like because it makes my striking surface a little bit smoother. Um, sure. And um, so I, I always love to wear those. And I you know I have to scour the internet trying to find uh, pairs of them because they released back in like 2010 and they've since been discontinued. So I'm going all over eBay or. Uh, you know, social media, trying to find people that are selling these old pairs. And so that's what I, I see. I'm still wearing them in this game. Um, this was uh, the last pair that I've got um, of my pink slippers. And, you know, up until this point, I would wear those exclusively. It was every, every single game. Um, but Nike came out with uh, an updated model of, a, of another shoe in their soccer line called the Phantom Vision. And this Phantom Vision model, uh, reintroduced the uh, the laces cover on top of the laces. So I, you have that nice, clean, smooth surface on top of it again. And so, um, you know, this season I stopped looking for pink slippers and uh, started uh, getting into uh, these Phantom Visions because it has that feature that I like on the cleats again. And Is that what so you against uh, Baylor in the Sugar Bowl? Yes, yes. Um, Are so they I, orange? And I, I, Yes, they're uh, they're silver and they have some red on the insides of the shoes. Um, okay. So those so those I wore for pretty much all of our road games this year. That silver pair, and then later in the season I got a red pair of the same model. It's it's a red pair that has uh, silver on the inside, which was you know perfect colors for UGA. And so for a uh, um, so I think it was maybe the Texas A&M game uh, was the second game I think that I wore them. Um, I, I wore them for our last couple home games, uh, and so so that. That's the model that I'm going to have going forward. And, and basically, I just wore the cleat to match our uniform. Um, for, <laughs> for you know, that, that was basically um, the reasoning behind it this year. I, I wore our silver uh, and red ones for our road games with our white jerseys. And then I wore the pink 
flippers or the red ones with our home games and our red jerseys. So, so how much would you have to kick in those cleats, but before you'd get them game ready? That, do you need to break them in, or what's that process? Yeah, um, you definitely need to break them in. Um, I would break them in during preseason camp. Um, I would I would wear them in camp for however long I needed to to feel like they were broken in and, and felt good on my shoe. Uh, you don't want to overdo it because you don't want to you know run them into the ground and tear them up before the season's over. So um, you know get them get them just right in preseason, uh, and then. You know, for me personally, my routine uh, for each week is whatever pair of cleats I was going to wear in a game on Saturday, I would wear it for practice on Thursday. Thursday was our last practice of the week, so I wanted to make sure that the most recent feeling that I had striking the ball was the cleats I'm going to wear in a game. So I would wear whatever game cleats I was going to wear for Thursday practice <laughs> and then toss them in the bag for, uh, for when we went for the game. Rod, we just saw a kickoff a few moments ago in this game, and, and it it looked like a squib kick or something. What was that intentional? What what was going mm -hmm. on with that kick? Uh, yes. Um, we we had a few kickoffs this year where we tried some some different things. Yeah. Um, trying to to throw off uh, the return team, um, or or you know just based on the conditions of the game. I think in, against Kentucky and Texas A&M, it was pretty rainy. Uh, the ball was wet and slippery, so we, we tried some squib kicks in those games as well. Uh, but, yeah, that squib was intentional, just trying to, you know, throw off their rhythm and, and throw off the timing of, of their kickoff return scheme. That's the thing. As, as the radio guys, we need a signal from the kicker to let us know when he's squibbing it intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> it really helps us a lot. <laughs> well, Otherwise, I'll, it looks like, you know, if it's in the middle of the game and it's a squib kick, it's like, ah, oh, did he miss hit it? What was, was that on purpose? We never know. <laughs> hey, guys, hey, guys, I want to jump in here real quick and ask Charles a quick question, and then uh, we'll let you guys go. Uh, obviously, you have walks to take and uh, balls to play with and stuff. Um, do you uh, – did, did Ugga like the lights, or did, it, did the lights going out during the stadium during this game – bother him at all or was he just kind of just kind of chill and didn't have an issue with it yeah we we generally try to get in the stadium uh probably about 10 minutes before the national anthem and usually i'm concerned if there's a flyover or not because he doesn't react well to large airplanes flying over his head and so i had already stuck him in his box and um, he, you know, he sits over there and takes a million pictures before the game. But when those lights went out, I could tell it was bothering him because he, he, uh, he kind of crept back in the, in the box a little farther than usual and, uh, and darting his head back and forth. But, um, that was the first time that I, that either the dog or myself or anybody in my family had ever seen the lights. It was very impressive. Well, we want to thank you for coming by and we appreciate it taking your time out of the day. I know the fans that are watching loved it and, uh, we appreciate and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in the fall. Well, I appreciate it. He's looking forward to taking off his shirt and going out and rolling in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Charles. Appreciate I'm looking it. forward to that, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Charles. Charles, thanks a lot. Right. And uh, Rod, real quick, we got a uh, question in from Facebook. Uh, Jay Wise is asking this. He goes, are your nerves the same for all kicks or are there times when you actually are more nervous? And does and does does somebody calling a timeout before uh, uh, a kick bother you? Um, so to answer the first part of the question about nerves for every kick, um, I think that I, I pretty much have the, the same kind of emotional state and mental state before every kick. Uh, I don't really notice that I have any, you know, heightened nervousness or anything when I go out for any kick, um, you know, whether it, we're playing against Notre Dame and it's a top 10 matchup or whether we're playing Murray State, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter when I go out for a field goal. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty much the exact same way, just kind of even keel when I go out every single time. Um, and for the second part, asking about timeouts, um, I don't really think that uh, – I don't really think it, it gets to me at all. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of coaches like the ice kickers to, to see what happens. Um, but, you know, when, when I do that, I feel like it just gives me an advantage because I just – just get a couple more opportunities to practice my swing, just take a couple more practice swings and, and just feel even that much better uh, about going out to try the kick. We just saw a situation where uh, Blaylock let the uh, Notre Dame was punting and, and uh, Dominic Blaylock let the ball bounce and roll and it kind of put the dogs in a little bit of a deeper hole than, uh, than they would have been had he been able to 
to kick that or to make that catch. Uh, and, and Rod, as, as a special teams guy, and that's a part of your special teams, I'm sure uh, the coaching staff would have preferred that uh, Dominic make that catch there to save the team about 10 or 12 yards. Uh, yeah, you know, um, Dom is, uh, you know, I, I think he had some uh, some growing pains this year, um, just, you know, being his first time in there. Um, but he's got tremendous hands. And I think over the years, the coaches are just able to kind of, you know, further coach him up and get him better and and just, you know, influence his decision making in a positive way. Um, I think. I think you know later in this later in the year uh he proved that he was making better decisions and making smarter yeah. decisions um, and i think that that's only going to carry over uh into the future where he's going to be even better for it and you know he's going to be able to get on top of those uh when he needs to to, to save our team some some hidden yardage uh, as like coach mark likes to call it you know if uh if a ball hits and gets another 10 yards of roll on a punt that's an extra first down that your offense needs to make. And that doesn't necessarily show up on the offensive stat sheet. It shows up on special teams. And so I think that, you know, as the year went on, um, the coaches did a great job of, of getting him better with his decision making. Uh, and it's definitely going to help with that hidden yardage uh, going forward in the years to come. We get a ground level view of uh, DeAndre Swift hurdling a, a guy going low, trying to tackle him. And Swift just jumped right over him for another five yards. I think, I think that's in the repertoire of every Georgia running back that we've had uh, since no Sean Marino, you know, instead of running over the guy or running around him, you just go over the top of him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. DeAndre, DeAndre did it as well as, as anybody. He's going to be, he's going to be fun to watch on Sundays and uh, wow. Got a lot of guys coming back in that are going to be able to, to, to fill his shoes and, uh, and, and, and keep this tradition of great Georgia running backs rolling, but he is, uh, it's going to, going to be sad not to see him playing between the hedges that's for sure you know I, i'm excited to see kendall milton uh play he's, he reminds me a lot of todd Gurley in his physique he's tall kind of runs upright and uh you know got that same kind of speed to get away from guys I, I'm, I'm interested to see how he transitions to the college game good i hope i hope we all get a chance to see him um uh, you know in september and in the in the coming months what do we got coming? Oh, here's another one of the. Uh... Another, hey, Rod, what do you block. think about these these guys going down on on these uh, when they were allegedly injured? Um, as player, what what's your take on that as a as a player? <laughs> um, I think just from a player perspective, you know, when when our offense gets rolling, I just hope that they can just continue to keep rolling. Uh, you know, we had. Uh, a couple of situations in this game where we went, uh, you know, up tempo. Uh, yeah. We started to go hurry up, and you know, it definitely uh, proved to have some positive results. Um, you know, I think uh, you know you can say uh, you can say whatever you like to say. Um, I'm, I don't want to comment on it. Um, I'm, I'm going to reserve my opinion for myself um, in, in terms of how I feel about it. But um, you know, I don't think you ever want to discount the fact that another team's player might actually be injured. You know, um, I think that you want to be able to respect that at all times. Um, you know, it might look different, you know, from the sideline, it might look different from the booth or in the stands. Um, but I don't ever want to, you know, I don't want to discount the possibility that someone might actually be injured. So it was frustrating. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the player safety for both teams is of the most importance. Um, and, you know, we, we, uh, at the end of the day, we ended up winning the game. So, uh, I think it all worked out. There, there was no misinterpreting Jake's. Jake's gestures there. I love that answer, Rodrigo. I, I will tell you, I'll, I'll answer just for me that um, <laughs> I know as, it's a, coming. As, a, as a quarterback, you know, I, I mean, listen, I, I'm pretty athletic and I'm pretty strong and stout. So I realize when you bump into <laughs> me that I could take you to your knees and, and, you know, Jake and I are pretty much the same size. I'm just not sure if, I, I mean, we're athletic, but are we that athletic? Are we that strong? <laughs> Pretty strong. The strongest <laughs> left arm in the game. It's unbelievable. I'm getting fired up watching this game now. And yeah. I was losing my mind in the booth. I mean, when we got off air um, and, and we're just kind of talking uh, uh, outside of during the game, uh, I think this this game, I, was, I may have been as animated as I've ever been off air about some of these flops that we were seeing. I mean, it. It really looked looked like a we've got a kicker on. I probably need to couch my words. It looked like a soccer game, is what it looked like. Yeah. What it looked like. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Hey, Scott, you know I, how frustrated we get. I got a soccer background. I don't know about you know, college, <laughs> basketball, 
gentlemen, you know, college basketball, Scott, we saw it a couple of times this year where the referees were calling. They, they, they instituted a flop rule, and they actually had a sign for, for the flop. Yeah. And, and well, we saw it called a few times. We may need to we may need to see that in in college football. I, I think there's a I think the uh, the officials are going to address that in in future seasons. I don't know what the determination is, like you know, or like Rod was pointing out. I mean, how do you know if if a guy's really hurt? I can give um, you two examples, Scott. That it's the two a that we saw in this game, one hundred percent, no doubt. There's no well, that doubt guy about had something that. in his eye. No, he didn't. That those were no. Those are it two was, prime it was examples. Jake Fromm's of, arm. Right. If a quarterback knocks somebody down, that's a flop. Well, it, it clearly was in this game. I, I don't think there's any question about it. <laughs> well, that, you know, it's it's frustrating as you when that when the offense is just really rolling and and the defense is you know as we like to say is they're on skates. Um, and then to have that happen, it just seems to get kind of against the ethics of the game. It is. Not kind of. I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, let's change the subject. Coach Smart, just, uh, Coach Smart just tweeted out that our conditioning is second to none. Coach Sinclair gives us an edge in the second half. Who's following his workout plan every day? So Ooh. he's not missing the opportunity to let the guys know he wants them working out while they're away. Are you doing that, Rod? <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> you got the chairs and the milk jugs and the whole deal going out in the in the driveway and oh, doing yeah, it? whatever it takes. Yeah, I'll I'll go on to Coach Sinclair's Instagram and his Twitter and, and see the workouts that he's posting on there. And you know any of that stuff um, that I that I can you know replicate at the house. You know I'll give him my best shot. That's got to be uh, that's got to be difficult unless you have something in your home. Uh, if you have yeah. a small gym in your home or weights or something, I mean, it, it's it's got to be uh, extremely challenging just to, you know, kind of approach the same level of conditioning that you need to to play this game. Yeah, um, you know, I think that definitely, um, you know, some of the guys that have been in the league for a long time and, uh, you know, have been able to make some renovations to their homes um, to, to include some in-home gyms and workout spaces, I think are definitely at an advantage at this point because they've still got most of the resources they need to be able to maintain their strength and um you know basically you just need a backyard to uh, you know to maintain your conditioning you know you can challenge yourself to the level that you need and you know your body knows when you're being pushed to the limit and and so you can do that to make sure that um that you're staying in shape and you know so i think that those guys are are at an advantage um if they have a they got their own gym at home and so hopefully you know once i can uh hopefully be around in the league for a while myself. Um, I can, I can invest in that for, you know, anytime the situation might come up in the future, maybe I'll, I'll have a gym of my own at home so that I can use it. We just saw one of the big catches of, of the game that Lawrence Cager catch on the sideline that is uh, helping to set up Georgia for a, uh, an approaching touchdown, I believe. Yeah. This see, that was a, that from throw to the sideline to, to Cager on that back shoulder. That was, that was a terrific pass and a great adjustment by by Lawrence. Yeah, and then the, the next play right back to Cager again. And this is coming off of uh, uh, the, the fourth quarter show with the LED lights where the, the stadium was just a glow in red. And uh, it was uh, – and then the first play there, the, the big pass to Cager. That's, this is really, really where we saw Lawrence Cager begin to emerge. I, I think everybody thought that he was going to be a, a really good addition uh, to this Georgia football team. I don't think anybody knew how good of a player and a dominant force uh, Lawrence Cager was going to be, but th this is where his catch radius just came on display and um, really unfortunate for the dogs that he couldn't stay healthy the entire year because he, he took this game over here in, in the fourth quarter. Now they, they called it the next play was another completion to Cager, but they nullified it because of a, a penalty they called illegal touching. Uh, and they, they flagged Charlie Werner for the play, but here, the situation was both uh, Werner and Cager were up on the line of scrimmage, so Lawrence was covering up Werner, who was in the slot, but he went downfield and blocked. He didn't catch the ball. He didn't touch the ball, but yet they called it illegal touching. I, I thought it should have been illegal man downfield should have been the call. Mm -hmm. I agree. But I wasn't ref in the game, so 
<laughs> and I think we uh, – is this is this the play where uh, – or is this – what happens here? Does uh, I think they get a cager touchdown coming up here in a second. That one out of the left side of the end zone, I believe, is, is the one that puts your, uh, Georgia up 20 to 10 here in a few moments. Well, well, right, Scott, you're right. It's pretty clear they were going to Cager a lot on this drive and uh, mixing in a few runs, but definitely going to the air. They've got Herring in the game now in the backfield to give Swift a little bit of a blow. DeAndre had almost 100 yards in the game. That throw to the front corner to Pickens. Couldn't quite get his hands on that one. You know, if that's in the Sugar Bowl, I think George makes that catch. Yeah, he I agree with you. He caught everything else in the in the bowl game. Yeah, Baylor's still trying to cover him. <laughs> that was a nice yeah. throw by Jake, but uh, it was good coverage by Notre Dame in that front right corner. And uh, I don't know, was there was there any interference there? There wasn't a flag thrown on it, but there was a lot of contact. And I, I thought that was – was. Oh, yeah, sad. there you go. Look, he's holding his jersey from behind. You get the right camera angle, then you can really see what's going on. <laughs> Uh, and it's uh, it's really you know the, the penalty on the catch by Cager where the dogs were rolling. It's uh, it, it happened a lot to us offensively last year for for whatever reason. Uh, just never could really get in get in sync um, on the offensive side of the football really until the Sugar Bowl where where Pickens just came out. But you know you look at the future of this program and the future of this receiving core led by um, Cage led by uh, Pickens. It's going to be something else and. At least on my screen here, uh, that was the back shoulder to Lawrence Cager, another back shoulder uh, to put the dogs up 20 to 10. And spinning in the air, he knew he, he knew where he was on the field in order to get that foot down. And uh, Chuck, that's something you and I saw uh, during basketball season a lot of times. You know, we talk about court awareness, knowing where you are on the field. Uh, we had a lot of guys catch a ball in the corner and their heel would be out of bounds and we'd turn it over in, in basketball. But, but Cager made a – just a, a tremendous acrobatic type catch right there. Spinning yeah, it the gets air, that foot down. Dragging the foot, got the one Here's foot down, made the catch. <laughs> touchdown. That was tremendous. Rod's down there breaking away, breaking up down his form for us on the uh, extra point. <laughs> oh. oh, I love the I love those strobe lights that they did uh, after the, after the touchdown. That was. Gosh, it was such an incredible atmosphere. Uh, Rod, what what, are, what is uh, what is your responsibility like when the team's driving like this? What what mode do you have to go into to know when your time's coming again? When you when you've got to get back into the ball game, are you just watching the game and then you know as soon as they score, you know if it's a if it's a one it's an extra point try, you're going in the ball game or you know what are you doing on the sidelines there? Yes, yeah, so I mean. Typically when, you know, when we're on our own half of the 50, um, Kamarta's, you know, taking over the net. Um, but when we cross the 50 and we get down, you know, around the 40-yard line at least, that's when I'll start taking over and uh, start hitting some kicks into the net after, you know, first down, second down, third down, what have you. Um, and, you know, I, I try to – I try to, I tend to think that I have a decent football IQ and, and understanding of the game and, you know, how much time is left in the game, the situation, the score, point differential, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, know uh, uh, if we score in this – situation um you know if we're going to be going for one or going for two uh most of the time we you know we kicked extra points and this was one of those situations where you know um, we go up by 10 points it's two scores regardless of how you slice it they need at least two scores to win the game and our defense was locking them down um for the most part pretty much all game, game. so um you know i felt pretty confident uh, as we were going down the field that we were going to kick an extra point and uh you know like i said before first down before second down before third down um i'm, I'm hitting kicks into the net just getting ready for any opportunity and uh sure enough on this just want it happened to be an extra point. Hey, guys. Hey, Chuck. Let me ask Conrad. You, you had an incredible figure of extra points. 200, well over 200 consecutive. Never missed one in your collegiate career at the University of Georgia. Uh, and when you stop and think about all that has to go right on an extra point with a snap, a hold, and a kick, you know, it's really an incredible streak that you had. Yeah, um, I think... You know, it's a testament to ha having 200 consecutive 
uh, well, for the most part, 200 consecutive clean operations by the snapper, holder, kicker, and our field goal protection team. Um, you know, you need every, every, you know, every 11, every one of the 11 guys that's on the, the field goal team uh, has to do their job to, to make a successful kick, a successful PAT or field goal. And so, you know, that's 200 consecutive opportunities where uh, all 11 guys went out and did their job. Um, even the one situation that we had at Tennessee and in, in, uh, or playing against Tennessee in 2018, where we had a little bit of a scare there. Um, you know, I just had trust in, in Jake to get the ball back up uh, and we were able to keep that streak going and, and just keep it alive. Guys, Rod, Rod needs to drop off now. I want to thank him for his time and uh, wish him good luck in the uh, draft next week. And uh, uh, good luck to you. And thanks again for uh, spending some time with us uh, this Saturday afternoon on Virtual G Day. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me. Rod, yeah. great to see you. Best of luck. Good luck, draft, Rod. As Mike pointed out, and uh, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right, so we're at, uh, what are we at, 20 to 10 now here in the fourth quarter? We are. And the good guys have the 20. <laughs> well, that's that's the good news. Uh, Georgia really stepped it up a notch in, in the second half, and uh, we're watching Jake Fromm on the sidelines there and his uh, excitement after they scored that touchdown to, to Lawrence Cager and um, – Boy, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, I mean, the, the place was just was just amped up at that point. And, uh, you know, you're up 10 with uh, most of the fourth quarter to go, but you felt really good about your position. Yeah, and uh, just a, just a dominant. You felt really good about your chances of walking away with a win at that point. Yeah, you really did. And just a dominant third quarter. Scott, I don't know if you've got the stats there in, in front of you, but it, the, you know, I think Notre Dame that moved the football pretty well um throughout uh, the the first half in that third quarter i think held uh, 19 20 yards um it, just a a great defensive performance and offensively got a little got a little rhythm going as yeah. as well to open this lead up they had they had 29 yards rushing after the third quarter <laughs> so i mean they just they ran the ball just i mean it was uh they were so one dimensional um, which is what you want to do if you're your your defensive football team. You want to make the other guys one dimensional, so you know what's coming, and that's that's what Georgia did to them. Uh, Notre Dame's only only uh, ability to move the ball really was through the air. As we look at Brian Kelly, uh, uh, yeah, being uh, upset with the officiating crew again. I mean, most of his most of his sideline shots were him arguing with uh with side judges and headlinesmen and referees he was he was not happy in in Athens last uh last <laughs> September you know guys what, one of the things we talked about is the challenge coming into to this upcoming year with with our offense not being able to be together under a new offensive coordinator and uh you know having new guys trying to learn a new system and and get to play with one another every offense is going to have that that challenge uh, if we're able to go go play, do you, do you think the fact that we've got such a seasoned defense coming back? Because every offense, even if it's a seasoned offense, offenses are always later to kind of get in a groove and, and gel with one another. Does it give us any kind of advantage coming off of a year where our defense was so dominant? And we've got so many guys coming back thinking here that offenses are going to be a step or two behind uh, where defenses are going to be naturally. The fact that our defense is so good, does that – does that play into to the, the benefit or the, the advantage to, to this Georgia football team if we're able to get on the field next year? Uh, under normal circumstances, I, th I think, yeah, because we were able to play so many guys uh, last season. And, and I think you pointed it out earlier. There, there really wasn't that one superstar uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, it was just a great unit. And, and I think we're going to see that again uh, this season, uh, hopefully as, as – you know, we get back to business and uh, because there were so many guys that, that played, I mean, we were playing, uh, I don't know, 30 something guys a game on defense. Uh, so everybody was getting, uh, getting some snaps, uh, you know, some more than others, obviously, but uh, I don't think that can do anything, but, but help this unit. And uh, as you, as you learn to play together and we've got most of those guys back that 
uh, that did play together last yeah. year. So I think that's a huge advantage for Georgia's defense. Scott, it, it was it was always interesting, Scott, post game to go into the locker room and. You know, I'd be back in uh, Coach Smart's office waiting for him to finish talking to the team to come back to do radio with us, post-game radio. And one of the first things that he would walk by, he'd already know exactly how many players played in the game. That was a big stat to him, was how many guys got on that field and saw action. Uh, so to your point, uh, that was not missed on the head coach that he was getting experience for a lot of young players that would certainly pay off down the road. How much, hey, Z, you, you may be able to answer this. Uh, I know you can better than I can, so that's why I'm going to ask you. But how, how much effort does it take to know which group of guys you want on the field on any down? I mean, there's constant substitutions, unless the offense on the other team is, is doing the, the tempo game and you, and you can't make those substitutions. But how much work goes into And we just saw J.R. Reed with a tremendous interception there. and Now he's feasting at the face mask. Uh, but... <laughs> How many, um, you know, how much work goes into it with the coaches to make sure you've got the right personnel on the on the field for that particular play? Yeah, it's it's well, it's you, you hear the stories and, and they're true of, of when you get into football season, everything. If you're a coach, everything, everything shuts down. You're watching film and preparing boy, in, in some cases, 20 hours a day, you know, 18, 19, 20 hours a day. You're sleeping at the office. Uh, because you are you are trying to get personnel matchups that if you see a, a, a certain set come in on the offensive side of the ball, you want to combat that set based on those tendencies with your own personnel. Some of it's obviously substitution to keep guys fresh, but uh, no, it is um, it's the reason hours upon hours upon hours are are put into study that uh, if if I've got certain looks or tendencies in terms of personnel, this is how I'm going to go match up right on the, the offensive or the defensive side of the side of the ball um, down a distance, obviously plays a role. So you've got guys that are, that are more specialized as pass rushers or, or run stoppers that will obviously play a role into it as well. So there's a, a bunch that goes into all of that. I just think it's, it's, it's kind of an overlooked skill that the, <laughs> that the, that the coaching staff has as far as, you know, maybe when you're watching the game, you just kind of take it for granted that everybody on the sideline knows when they're supposed to go in and they know what the situation is. But, you know, that's the coaching staff doing that, subbing guys in and out and and uh, the right packages for the right play. And, you know, it's, it's such a strategic game at that point, knowing that you, you need the right person. And it doesn't always happen. That's you know, right. Sometimes you got the wrong players on the field and they run a play different from what you're anticipating or what you, you know, what you feel like they're going to run and, and you get caught, you get caught red handed in, in the wrong play or with the wrong personnel. But uh, Georgia did that so well last year, defensively, especially having the right players on the field at the right time. Yeah. We're just, we're, we're so well coached and, you know, Chuck, I'd love to get your insight on, on this, just with the amount of players and the reason it's, it's such a point of emphasis you know, when you have guys that contribute, it does so much to the morale, even if it's, even if I've contributed three or four plays versus not being able to get on onto the field, how much, how much does the morale boost of, of playing a lot of guys play into what coach smart wants to do? Uh, because you're, you're there with them probably more than, than, than any of us for sure. Uh, does he well, ever talk about that? Oh yeah. The post game. It's so obvious in the locker room, Z. I, I know you know it from your playing days, but it, it's real obvious in the locker room when he's playing that many guys because everybody, like you say, everybody feels like they had a hand in the team's success. And even guys that were playing special teams for maybe a couple of plays, you know, they're excited. And they're jumping around and they're fired up. And then you've got recruits in that locker room and they're seeing this energy and excitement that everybody's sharing in. And it just sort of trickles over into that you know, it plays a huge role in recruiting, which all puts a big smile on the head coach's face. They had just had the J.R. Reed interception. They had to review that. And that was just a tremendous interception. We were talking about the cager catch uh, a few moments ago. I mean, just a tremendous effort by J.R. Reed sliding right on the sideline, made the catch, either got a, no, a, a, a knee or a toe, 
or something inbounds on the Notre Dame sideline to uh, take the ball back for uh, for Georgia. Notre Dame had two uh, book had two picks in that ball game. That one and the one earlier by Divide Wilson, and then Swift with a really nice run up the hash, uh, going left to right, and to kind of put the dogs in motion for more points here coming up. Yeah, Scott you know, just had a, a great play dialed up there, too. Uh, Notre Dame ran a flea flicker. We had corner fire on uh, that just disrupted that play from the – really from the, the snap and obviously the great reaction of J.R. Reed. And at, at this point, a uh, big run by, by DeAndre Swift to start that next drive off by the dogs. You felt like this game was about to be put on, on ice and we were about to run away with it. Uh, at least that's <laughs> what I was feeling like in the booth. Yeah, but you know what, Z? I'm sitting here watching this 10 minutes to play. We're up 20 to 10. We've got the ball at midfield. And all I can remember is how I was sweating bullets in the final 30 seconds. You, you, that, that's exactly right. It, but right now, at this point in the game, I, I really thought that we were about to blow this wide open uh, and and just catapult the, the, the program and get all kinds of, of – and listen, we won the football game. We were – uh, a part of the national conversation all year, but it felt like at this point, uh, Jeff Dancer, when he was on, he talked about that run that we went on with double digit wins and, uh, and how we were just blowing people out. That's what this game felt like at yeah. this point in time. And, and, and you're right. It was uh, pins and needles when, when we got down to it by the end of it. Well, this, this is the drive. There's a nice catch by um, Robertson in the middle of the field. Uh, you know, the clock's working against Notre Dame at this point, but they put themselves back into a situation to, to uh, have a shot at winning the ball game. They, they hold Georgia here to a, a field goal try, and uh, we had it fourth and one, I think, and then Kirby decided to take the points with Rod. He was, uh, he was a sure thing uh, last, uh, last year in this ball game. He ends up with a 43-yard field goal uh, coming up here soon to put Georgia up. Uh, by 13 at the time and then Notre Dame got a quick score and then they eventually got the ball back again and that's that's why Chuck was sweating bullets there in the final 30 seconds and don't tell me you weren't either <laughs> I didn't I ain't got no time to sweat hey Scott you know what you brought it up quick question you know when when a game is like this and it's down to the wire and you're trying to do obviously your job with your spotter and your board and you've got to get commercial reads in and things like that. What's that? Are you able to appreciate the game while you're in the middle? And this is for you, Z, and also for you, Chuck. While you're calling the game, are you able to appreciate it as as being a great game while you're in the middle of it? Uh, kind of, maybe, uh, you know, I, I understand the point of what you're saying. I, I, I get a lot more out of it when I go back and watch the replay uh, because uh, things happen so fast, especially with teams using tempo now and speed, you miss a lot. Uh, I mean, I, you call the play, but all of a sudden they're running another play and you don't have, you don't have a chance to, to savor the previous one, especially if it was something great. Um, so I learn a lot from, going back after the game, after we've called the game and, and watching a, a TV replay like this, you get a lot of different angles. Uh, you see blocks that maybe you didn't see in real time. Um, uh, yeah. And, you know, and we're, we've got a lot of going on from a sponsor standpoint. So we're, we're trying to juggle all of that. There's, there's a lot of moving parts to, it's not, we're just standing up casually and, and uh, really, taking in and savoring uh, the game every play it's you know there's a there's a process to what we're doing in the radio booth as well um but, but we I, I get a I get a real appreciation for the game and for the effort of the team uh when I get a chance to go back and watch the the tv replay of it you know from where I stand down on the sideline it seems like uh seasons kind of develop a theme and that was kind of a theme uh, Mike, for this past year where we'd have leads and be sweating at the end uh, that started with this game. You can talk about the Florida game. You can talk about the Auburn game uh, where we still had to make big plays in the closing minutes uh, to hang on to a victory. Yeah, and for, for me, it, the uh, I, I get the emotion of the game. I, I can absolutely, I can absolutely feel. And, um, you know, as we're, we're going through it, 
Scott has got so much that he, that he's got going on, and as I'm I'm looking at defenses and uh, you know my my roles are, is a little bit different that that the emotion of the game I can get tied into, um, and it is I remember uh, going back to the to the Rose Bowl and to the national championship game and some of these big games that we've been in. Uh, that that I am physically exhausted <laughs> at the end of the first half, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I can get through to the to, to the second half. So so that emotion of the game, I'm a fan like everybody everybody else is, and and you you get tied up into it. Obviously, we've got a lot of different things that are going on that we're focused on, and and, and have to take a little bit of that emotion out so we can can hopefully bring something that is is fun for the the people that are listening to us. Um, but yeah, that, that emotion of the game, the emotion of these games, when it gets tight, uh, near the end, um, a little bit different than when you're playing for sure. But, uh, you, you still, I, at least for me, I still get, I still get caught up into, to the, 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 the fandom of the game and the emotion of, of the game. Uh, and it makes it, it makes it fun, of course, but it can, you can be sweating bullets at the end too, as Chuck mentioned. Well, one of the things they're in a timeout here in the fourth quarter now, Georgia's got that fourth and one coming up uh and they decide to kick uh try for the field goal but you know one of the things z that i i kind of lose i don't know if i lose focus or I lose track or what but i my recall for specific plays in all these games that have piled up over the years is is less and less than it used to be i you know i can remember some some moments of, of big games, but I was asked a question earlier this week on a radio station about the 2013 LSU game. And it just, I, you know, when they asked me that, it's like, I, I got nothing. <laughs> I couldn't remember it. It's like, they all just kind of stack on top of each other after a while. And uh, I just don't have that, that high recall skill, I guess, uh, to remember every play and every down and distance and every situation. Now, some I do, but there's a lot of stuff that I, I got to go back and watch the game again and re-familiarize myself with it before I can. Oh yeah, okay, I remember what yeah. happened and what set that up now. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, with you. you. You know what's amazing is how coaches, particularly Coach Smart, well he can tell you exactly. Uh, he, I mean he remembers every like down golfer and the, the play that remember was the shot and the club and the situation. Yeah, you know, yeah. in the whole 18, 18 holes. It's like I how do you I, I couldn't do that. Now it's I, I would when I played, I could remember those. When I was actually in the game, I could I could remember specific throws or specific plays. But I am exactly like you when when calling the games is that going back, I'd have to watch the game in order to develop some of that recall. And I and I not sure quite the reason the the reason why, but the the individual obviously the big ones stand out, but it, yeah. it is the, I remember the flow of the games much more than I remember the specific plays in a game and kind of looking back on it um, because they, they don't stand out. But when, boy, when I played those individual plays would stand out, I could go back and, and, and probably recall those even to the, even to today. But if you asked me about the 2013 LSU game, I would be just like you. I've got nothing for you. <laughs> I, I had to go back and look it up and look at stats and everything. Oh, okay, now and, and that was a that was a great game. I mean, it was sure. it was Murray and Mettenberger, and it was boom, 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 and it was you know it was just a slugfest. And the, the game was in the forties on both teams, and it was a terrific game. It's like how did I not remember that? But this game I remember pretty well. Uh, maybe maybe it's the the fact that it's not it wasn't seven years ago. It was just last year. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We're, we're waiting you, on uh, the commercial break to be over here from uh, SEC Network. And uh, did Rod already try the field goal, or, or is that coming up? That's coming up. Okay. That's coming up still. Because he takes it. They're up 10, and they're going to go up 13. Uh, spoiler alert, they're going to go up 13 <laughs> and because uh, he kicks uh, the 43-yarder. Uh, Rod was with us earlier today, and thanks to him again. But he had a, he had a terrific day against uh, Notre Dame last year. Made all of his kicks. Uh, all of his kickoffs were out of the end zone when. Oh, uh, when he did make out it. The end zone. He, and he's already made it. He's already made the field goal. I guess yeah, I'm on. A, okay. I'm on a delay. I, I'm I'm not as caught up as you are there, Chuck. So I'm still in commercial break here. Okay. Thanks for spoiling it for me. You must have. Uh, you must have satellite television. 
I've got YouTube TV is what I'm on right now. Okay. There you go. So Scott, I've got a question for you. Do, do you have a, a personal most memorable call? Uh, this is going to be another one of those moments. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there's, um, I can't, I can't think of one. That, I have one for you. I mean, you I've got about, some from Munson. I've got some of those. How about, how about the one you, you call Matthew Stafford in overtime in Tuscaloosa? That. <laughs> yeah, we that remember one. that one. I remember that one. That, the, the, that, that was a, uh, yeah. So I mean, that, that would be one that sticks out for me is uh, that was just fantastic. I mean, a lot of them do. The, well, um, that was, that was our first game together when, together. Uh, when Larry uh, no longer did uh, road games, he wasn't that, traveling at that point. So that 2007 Alabama game was, was a chance for Eric and I to, to uh, work together really for the first time other than, uh, at, at a practice or on somebody's couch watching a video or something like that, <laughs> like we had to do. That's uh, right. But yeah, that was, that was a, that was a great game out of the shoot. And, uh, I do remember how loud it was, how loud we were, we were screaming and hollering at the top of our lungs. And uh, <laughs> it was, it was a great moment. Yeah, it really was. I, I do remember, I remember screaming into the microphone and <laughs> having to get told to calm down several times. <laughs> I remember our spotter, uh, Lewis Phillips, was our spotter at the time, and he asked me at halftime why – he said, why is Eric talking so loud? Why is he screaming so loudly? I was like, well, I guess he's excited. I That was it. <laughs> I'm excited too, you know. Um, hey, Scott, uh, we did get somebody in the chat room, uh, namely Jen Gallus, who we all know and manages our social media. Uh, she suggested take that pig – Oh, take that pig! Yes. The Tennessee game Howard. A years ago, pig Howard for Tennessee. When uh, I do remember that when we were playing Tennessee here, and uh, he got the ball, and Georgia got a big play on him defensively and knocked him for a loss. And and uh, well, you know, a guy's got a name like Pig. You got to do something with it. That will forever be one of my favorite calls for you. <laughs> take that pig. Okay, we'll go with that one then. That was fun. That was fun. A lot of them come and go. You know, I, uh, I think we remember a lot of Munson's calls so much because of uh, the fact that for many, many years, that was the only way you were able to follow the game. That's right. It was radio only. You know, every now yeah. and then you get on television, but uh, you had to listen to the radio broadcast. And if you didn't, you missed it because there weren't replays. Although Georgia did start a thing with uh, with Dan McGill and and uh, doing highlights from each season and um, and those were great and those were uh, you know it's kind of like it archived each season for Georgia fans, um, but I think that's one of the reasons why we remember the uh, the older radio guys that have been in college football, college sports, and are so special to to the game over the years. That's why we remember their calls so much. Because if you wanted to follow your team, that's how you had to follow your team. If you weren't, you know, one of the biggies on the game of the week on ABC, the one game that they showed on a Saturday. Uh, so you you learned to, you know, it was appointment radio at the time. But now there's there's so many different ways to watch and listen. And uh, you don't even have to listen on game day. You can go back and listen on a Wednesday if you want to, to the game that was played the previous Saturday. Uh, so there's a lot of different options now. And. Uh, we don't necessarily catch everything uh, like we used to. Scott, we've also had a suggestion from the chat room from uh, Alan in Bogart that uh, he would like to nominate Chubby Time. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I second Chubby Time, too. It probably is on some sites, but um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I was just handed a note. Uh, Brendan Douglas at the Missouri game, a 10 for the flip and a six for the score. That was good. When he got that knocked over. I remember knocked that one. Over. So I remember that one too. So your, your family is submitting uh, favorite calls now, Scott? Yeah, we're, we're just trying to move it along here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, Jen's husband, uh, Elijah, gave me a really nice framed photo of that play 
with that call and a caption and I have it framed in my office. Uh, so I get to see it every day, but uh, that was really nice of, of Elijah to, uh, to give me that a couple of years ago. And I, I really appreciate that. Well, Notre Dame is driving down the field again. So I'm starting to get nervous once again. <laughs> and and I, I know the, the outcome. So the dogs, little corner fire. So we ended up going single safety there as we, as we brought the corner. Notre Dame did a good job of picking up. They released Komet right down the, the seam. So we got caught there in the rotation, getting into uh, the man-to-man -man coverage behind that corner fire. And Ian Book threw a strike. And Notre Dame just marching right down the field here with 418 left. You, you, you feel like it was in control. And all of a sudden, and now you start thinking, boy, they score right now. And uh, they, they're going to get another chance of getting the football. Uh, this is a whole lot tighter than we thought it was going to be at the 10 minute mark of the game. Yeah, I think we were, we were probably urging uh, from the booth to, uh, you know, put the foot on the throat. Let's finish this thing so we can quit having this feeling of, of anxiousness and urgency, <laughs> but it never happened. It never happened. Notre Dame kept coming and, uh, and they were able well, to score. It, and at this point in the game, game, one possession that, game and then, uh, uh, you know, it came down to the final minute. At this point in the game, I'd moved down in the end zone and was standing uh, with Greg McGarity uh, down at the tunnel there underneath the goalpost. And uh, I, I got to tell you, between the two of us, uh, we we were pretty tight. <laughs> You're sweating it out, huh? Yeah. yeah. So it's your it, fault. It was, like, you can't move off the field into a different position. It's like Scott talk, jinxing our kickers and our quarterbacks and everybody – you guys do those things all the time that put us in, in really sticky situations. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not like putting my socks on the right way, the same way every week. I don't you, do that. Well, you, you can't change positions. And, and Scott, this year, we're going to have to really work on this. You know, we haven't missed an extra point in X number of tries. <laughs> Since Marshall Morgan was kicking. That's the last time we missed one. It was against Vanderbilt, and uh, they blocked it. And you pointed out that through Rod's tenure, never missed. Every extra point was good that he attempted. Well, it's because we have to stay on you constantly about not, not see, putting the jinx. See, uh, working with you over these last uh, 13, 14 years, however long it's been, you've made me aware of that. And I have to change how, how I call a game and what I say <laughs> so I don't so I don't uh, irritate you over there and you attack me for jinxing us. Well, it's, it's jinx. It's, it's the Bulldog Nation that, that I'm protecting. It's not me. It's the Bulldog no, it's Nation. You. <laughs> it's, you already admitted how superstitious you are, but I, that does go through my head. So if I say this, is Zyre going to jump on my case? <laughs> so sometimes I'll say it just to, uh, just to just, get that back just, and Just forth. to get under my skin a little bit. I have, okay, I got to save it and it run works. it by you during a timeout or something. Um, hey, can I say this coming up? You know, this is the this is the fact. This is the stat. Here's a stat for you, because I was looking at this on, uh, I think it's uh, sportsreference.com or something. Anyway, I wanted to see how many teams were undefeated against Notre Dame, like Georgia is. Yeah. They're three and oh. Three and oh. So teams that have played multiple games against Notre Dame in in history. How many do you think are undefeated against the Irish? Other oh. than uh, Georgia, I've already given away the, the lead yeah. there. Georgia's 3-0. and oh. There's one other team that's undefeated that's played multiple games, not just one time. Yeah. But that's played more than one game against Notre Dame in the history of college football, and they're undefeated against the Irish. Who I, is I, it? Any guesses? I, uh, Texas. That is incorrect. Chuck, Al you got a guess? Alabama? That is incorrect. <laughs> it's wow. Oregon State. Who? Oregon State. I, I, I never would have gotten that. I, I didn't either. I mean, they're 2-0 yeah. and o against Notre Dame. And that's the only other team I could find on that, on that site that had never lost to the Irish that had played multiple games. Because I thought Georgia being 3-0 and o against Notre Dame is pretty impressive. There's no other team in the SEC that's unbeaten against them. And they haven't, they haven't played everybody in the league, but they have played a good uh, portion of the teams. 
Uh, but Georgia's the only SEC team that's never lost to. Well, we got a six point lead now. We got to hold on for three more minutes. So right yeah, now, I'm, I'm uh, extremely nervous. 23 to 17 with uh, 312 to go. Oh, and another flag. An down. But they didn't throw it. So, so Scott, we, we got a question here around some other traditions that that we've that we have in the in the booth. Um, we, we broke a little bit from this. You, you know, we, you've gone out and, and been the 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 man to bring the snacks in, right? I'm the, the snack in. master. But now this it used year, to be Shivani. That, and then, like, like he does in so many of his duties, he started shucking him again. <laughs> so I am the snack master. Oh, you and brought the cookies. Today. This is oh yeah, we've got the cookies. The and and your your beautiful bride this year started to, to make homemade snacks. Oh yeah. That I, I gained 15 pounds. Tell her thank you very much. Well, this well, is I mean, they're not healthy snacks. They're just it's it's just uh, it's comfort food because these games are hard. Well, they, we gotta have we gotta have something. <laughs> Perry <laughs> Langston. Perry Langston during guys. uh during these intense ball games. I gotta tell you, Perry Langston, who handles you know, the coaches' headsets for all the coaches, every halftime, he brings me one of those Crustables, a, a, a Rice Krispies treat, and a Powerade. So that's what <laughs> I have every halftime. And my thanks to Perry for, for taking care of me. Well, Perry takes care of a lot of people. Uh, maybe my favorite, my favorite part of, of, of game day is, is probably coming up to the booth from our pregame show and, and figuring out what we have to, to eat and, and eating that as fast as I can before we're, we're on air. That's it. It's close. Every time. I'm getting yelled at by Shivani half the time. Well, you know, you've heard of the freshman 15. I, I was going to say earlier, you know, we're all, we're all gaining the COVID-19 now <laughs> that we're all inside. But that's kind of a, there's kind of a halfway point, I guess, during football season where uh, I guess you could argue that, you know, from the start of September until – uh, the end of our bowl game, how much weight did we put on? Because we were eating these every Saturday. <laughs> a lot. Wish I had them now. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll have one for you. <laughs> Double, Elfwood doubles. So I, I had my, my, my beautiful bride, Julie, just brought down some banana bread for me. So if you're having that. Oh, good, what? Some banana bread that she made. Is it orange? It's no, it's it's not orange. You guys are so lucky. It's it's not orange. <laughs> what, Chuck Lane's not bringing you stuff? No. <laughs> well, if it is. If it is, it's stuff for me to go ship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, there's uh, Notre Dame's getting ready to kick it off here in the final three twelve. It's twenty three to seventeen. You remember it well. Nobody left the stadium either. Now, and this is where in, in years past, the, the, the previous couple of years, where we were so good running the football that th this is where we would ice these games. And, yeah. um, you know, Chuck, you mentioned that we got into a little, the, the theme of the year really was, was this, is that, that how many games did we have comfortable leads in going into the fourth quarter where you th would think naturally because of our, our depth and, how big and strong we are that we would separate there. How many times the, those, those games came down to the wire last year. And this was the, the start of that, that not so nice trend that we got into. Yeah. It was, I mean, you stop me, but even Kentucky, you know, gave yeah. us a tough one. I mean, we just couldn't, couldn't separate. And uh, you know, here's a chance you get a couple of, of, a first down, Notre Dame's got one timeout left. Uh, you've dominated the second half, absolutely dominated it up until this last drive. Um, and, and all of a sudden, now you're, you're sitting up in the booth and you, you are, you're getting tight because, or you're sitting in the stands and getting tight because it's, um, you know, you, you don't get a first down here. Notre Dame's going to have pretty good field position and they're going to be right back in it with a chance to win the football game. Well, we had a, Power formation there. We tried a jet sweep with uh, James Cook, and uh, one of the linebackers for the Irish shot through and made a nice tackle. I think our tight end missed the block or got there late or something. So now George is behind the sticks or second and 14. 
and then we get jammed up at the line of scrimmage. So all of a sudden you're third down and long, you know, the clock's not moving fast enough. They just use their last time out two sixteen to left. And, uh, and we're getting kind of, uh, kind of antsy up in the booth. Oh yeah. They're very antsy, you know, and obviously the first down play and, and this drive, you, you lose yardage. You, you don't want to throw the football because you want to make Notre Dame burn that timeout, which they, which they did. Um, you know, it just, it's when you play good football teams, you've got to put them away when you, when you have an opportunity and the dogs over the past couple of years have been so, so good at it this year, just really never, never could get into that rhythm offensively. And, and it's why we found ourselves in so many tight games, but it's also a, a testament to uh, the, the young men on this team and the coaching staff that, you know, you, you put the, the run of the past three years, that kind of a string together uh, where you're in that national conversation, you're doing a lot of things right. And you're playing to the strength of, of your football team. And, and we did a good job of it last year, just not as comfortable as the previous couple of years. <laughs> That's one way to put it, I guess. But uh, well, you, you come away with a 12 win season and that's not too shabby. No, not at all. I mean, it's uh, against, uh, and, and I think Jeff Dancer was talking about it today, that gauntlet that we had to run in November, just a powerhouse tough. team after powerhouse team. Um, it, it took its toll on the, the dogs, but really impressive to have our back against the wall to have to go run that gauntlet to, to get to where we needed to be. Uh, you can't say enough good things about, uh, about the, the 2019 Georgia Bulldogs. It's, it's all about the, the week to week mentality. I mean, you hear that ad nauseum, but it's, it's a hundred percent accurate. It, it absolutely, and that's what Kirby's done such a good job of. He has changed the mentality to, to one of, I don't care who we're playing, big game or not big game, it is about achieving our standard of excellence. And it's, it's infiltrated, I think, the entire athletic uh, 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 complex, and everybody's bought into it. And you see it, and almost where you see it more than, think about in, in years past, before Kirby got here and we've gone on this run, how many times did we get into big games and the emotion was so high that you know, we got run out of the, the, the park and got run out of the park early because the game was too big for us. Those things don't happen anymore. It's very businesslike. Uh, now we can go get beat, right? And, and we've been beat, but it is a very businesslike attitude and mentality where we really are playing to be as good as we possibly can be the vast majority of the time. All right. What, what are you guys thoughts on that play that just happened? We missed the third down play. It's fourth down. We got a punt and Kamarta shanks it. <laughs> well, let's go back to the, get the ball down. at the 48 yard line. Let me tell you, let's go back to the third down play. How close was that play to being disaster? It almost blew the up. Ball, yeah, we the ball the laying on the ground. And again, people talk about Jake from what he did for Georgia or what he didn't do. That's where Jake Fromm pays dividends. He was so cool, so calm, just reached down, picked up the football, and still threw it downfield and almost had a chance to get that complete to George Pickens. Yeah, and threw it in a spot there too, Chuck, where only his guy could go get it. And after that ball hits the ground, you know, everything goes, goes haywire in your mind. To have the wherewithal and the composure to, to stay calm, pick it up, not panic, and deliver a pass where it's not, you know, where, where it's not yeah. going to get intercepted. Really, really impressive. That was an, it was an Eric Zier type play. It Our was defense much better. in the last minute, though, was, was outstanding. We got really good pressure on book on many of these snaps. Uh, there's good pressure right there, although he got it out of the pocket. They get one to Claypool over on the far sideline. They make the catch, move the stick, stop the clock. Uh, it's almost like you just want to cover your eyes. You can't look anymore. <laughs> right, and, and how how thankful for you right now that, that Kirby Smart in that fourth and one put three points on the board as opposed to going for it Yeah, right now. No, that, that turned out to be the right decision, uh, certainly as, as how this game would end. And, uh, you, you know, you, t you take the points with a very reliable kicker, one of the best in the nation, and, 
and he converted and uh you know they have to score a touchdown to to win the game a touchdown and an extra point so it really puts the pressure on them and now they're out of timeouts that's right and again that's where the crowd noise comes into it you think through all the penalties and all the little things that made a difference in this football game um the emotion of of the 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 day and you get to this point and and man the last thing you want to see here is get your heart ripped out where Notre Dame scores and, and potentially swipes one from you, especially the way you took over the game for for the, the most of the second half. That last play, it looked like Notre Dame's left tackle got away with a hold. I didn't see, get a replay of that, but there's hey, probably Z, a lot of that going on too. Z, let me ask you a question as a quarterback here. Um, would you rather to have the defense – have them sending guys after you, trying to throw you off your spot, or would you rather them, you know, packing them in and putting dropping eight guys in this into coverage, and and you got to find that really really tiny hole? Yeah, at at, at this spot in the field, uh, the I, I would rather somebody come after me. If now if we're back, if we're backed up and having to drive, I, I'd rather to, I'd rather see a defense that's dropping eight just so we can move the, move the football and get ourselves into position. Um, but, you know, as you, as you get into scoring position, I'd much rather see somebody trying to come after me, um, only because now I know I'm going to have more opportunities to, to get the football into the, uh, to the end zone. If I've got a score, I'd rather see that. Um, now, I, I wouldn't want to see that. I'm not a proponent of, of getting into drop eight situations and, and keeping the football in front of me because for good offenses, it's much easier to move the football down the, down the field versus facing all kinds of oncoming rushers and uh, exotic looks. But if I've got to go score, I'd much rather see a defense try to bring pressure just to create some opportunities. Z, Coach Smart just tweeted out, these games against Notre Dame went down to the wire. They took years off my life. <laughs> Can we retweet and say me too? Not, not, not as many as him. <laughs> they were both uh, they were both pretty darned exciting from the the one in seventeen with the with the big play by Bellamy and Carter and the, oh. the strip sack and then the the way this one ended with just really good defensive pressure and and forcing Book to to throw up a prayer to try to extend the ball game. Here it is right here. As we're watching uh, Nolan Smith and and Jermaine Johnson really get great pressure, and uh, then he just threw up a jump ball, a hail mary that uh, was not answered for the Irish. And we had Webb and DJ Daniel make a nice play on the ball, knock down the ball, and uh, so Georgia finally could take that heavy breath of relief with 48 seconds to go in the ball game. <laughs> and they just show the Notre Dame people. I think the Notre Dame fans really. As soon as they got the ball back for that final time, guys, I mean, at least from the TV shots, you could tell they were confident they were going to win the ball game. They thought they yep. were going to win. That's right. They, they had done it before. They thought they were in a position to win this football game. And uh, just what a great defensive stand in a, in a, a historic day uh, at the University of Georgia with Notre Dame coming in. And, and what a way for this game to, to finish and to win and to go celebrate and to, to, to ring the chapel bell. It, pretty special indeed. You know, I thought that that 17 game really ignited the season and, and really ignited the, the Kirby Smart era when we went up to South Bend and won that ball game. And Georgia With a true freshman quarterback. To the playoffs and the Rose Bowl and the national championship game and all of that. And um, That one's hard to top, but this one was a great home experience. Uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I don't know that this one ignited a season like like I think the one in 2017 did, uh, but it was a great experience for, for Bulldog fans. And, um, you know, you got a team that had never been to your stadium uh, on your home field and you were able to win the ball game and uh, you'll be able to keep that forever and ever. You know, you stop and think about that one up there too. That was a, a true freshman quarterback making his first road start and what a place. I agree. Yeah, those, are, those are two games. Those are two uh, two highlights, certainly for uh, uh, for me as a as a broadcaster to to call a game from Notre Dame and and then to uh, to be able to work this game last year. It was uh, they were two phenomenal games from our standpoint. I mean, you 
you'd get a different viewpoint from from the Irish side of the aisle. But uh, for Georgia fans to meet Notre Dame twice in that home and home series was you, you couldn't ask for more. That's what you that's what you hoped and prayed for would would happen if you were a Bulldog fan. Well, guys, I got to tell you, it, it wasn't G Day. It wasn't where we wanted to be today. But if we couldn't be there, this was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun to relive it uh, and to share it with you guys and from a different perspective and to have the guests that we had, it, it made for a great afternoon. Yeah, it really did. It's uh, it's great to see your faces and, and hear your voices. I wish we were together, but you're right, Chuck. This is, uh, I guess, the next best, best thing in, in the environment we're in. Stay safe, guys. Um, I can't wait till we can do this for real, hopefully very soon. Um, and go dogs. Yeah, go We're dogs. We're not doing the Steve. game like this in uh, in September. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be thanks, challenging thanks. if we do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. Good to see you, my friend. You Stay too, safe. you guys as well. And thanks, a big thanks to Mike Bilbo and Jen Gallus and everybody behind the scenes to help put this together uh, today. It's been a lot of fun. We hope you enjoyed it, Z and Chuck. I'll be talking to you guys real soon. So go dogs and have a great rest of your virtual G day, Dog Nation. <laughs> Go dogs. Go dogs.